Okay, we're going to start the meeting. Good evening, thank you for coming. Um, I think most people here for our presentation on the affordable housing proposal for Winter Chog Hill. We put that early in the agenda, so that way you won't have to sit through the entire board of select meeting. If you don't, you're more than welcome to, but we won't be done until about nine o'clock, but you're more than welcome to stay if you'd like to. With that said, uh, I'm Bob Carlson, the first selectman. We also have Brett Mastriani, selectman and select woman, Nicole Porter. Admin Finance Director is Christine Dias. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you. Before we get started, is there any public comment on non-agenda items? Speaking of public comment, just so you're aware, when we have the presentation, we will not wait to the end of the meeting for public comment. We'll do the presentation, and then we'll open for public comment after that. So you won't have to sit through and wait to the end of the meeting. Okay, is there any public comment on non-agenda items? Anything online? Why is this microphone so loud? Okay. Uh, are there any selectman comments? Nothing in particular, but I love to see the attendance here tonight. If we can have this on all selectman meetings nights, this would be fantastic. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, Brett. Nicole, anything from you? Okay. Uh, first selectman comments. Uh, glad to know that our early learning center that is leasing the two story wing is opening, I believe, on Monday, and they're giving this board of selectmen a tour on Friday. So, all reports so far that it's a wonderful program. They did wonders with the inside of the building and it's revenue for the town. So it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, number six, uh, first item tonight would be keep North Stone's affordable presentation. Uh, so Mary Ann, would you like to, how you want to handle that? All, yes, all presenters will be on that microphone. And if you have public comment, please do it from that microphone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marianne Richter. I live on 421A Wyasha Road, and I am president of Keeping North Stonington Affordable. I'd like to say a little bit about what Keeping North Stonington Affordable is and what it is not. HINSA was formed out of the objective that was in the 2013 uh, housing plan, which was adopted by the Affordable Housing Committee and adopted by the Board of Selectmen. And in that document, an objective was to form a housing trust. That morphed or changed since it was simpler to go out and form a 501 uh, uh, nonprofit corporation, which we did in 2017. And in 2018, we got our nonprofit 501c3 status. Um, its mission reads, and, and let me just take a minute to, to read our mission. Kins's mission is to ensure that the people of North Stonington and those wishing to live here can find housing within their budgets by using available housing, by using available private and public funding, we will provide affordable housing options for first time home buyers, seniors, and those who otherwise cannot afford to live in North Stonington. We will do so in a manner which enhances the diversity of our community while retaining the rural character of our town. So under that, as a mission statement, we move forward to form an independent entity, but that had our roots in the Affordable Housing Committee. Now the Affordable Housing Committee is an arm of the town government. So we are separate from that. And uh, that, that is sometimes very easily uh, misunderstood. And I often get questions of how are you different or are you part of? And yes and no, we were, and now we're an independent uh, agency. I would like to spend a few minutes 
talking about the uh, our our uh, board of directors, and I have a brief bio on each one of them. And I thought it was important to do this to show that every one of our board of directors is a citizen of our town, very deeply embedded into the community. So let me start with the bio of Jennifer Dayton. She's been a board member for in uh, 2022. She has a background in economics and training in economics. She's been a delegate to uh, represented the town meeting in another Connecticut town, chair of state relations for Connecticut Board of Eds, and in North Stonington served on the subcommittee uh, of the Education Cent Center and on the Economic Development Committee. Denise Hawk, board member since 2021, her current occupation is a teacher at Integrated Day School in Norwich, former fundraiser for Trinity College and Center for Hospice Care, served on North Stonington Affordable Housing Committee 2020 to 23. Juliet Hodge, that's a familiar name, is board member since 2021. She's currently employed as director of land use in East Ledyard. She's a past planner in the town of North Stonington for 10 years chaired the 2013 POCD committee uh, and is now currently chair of the 2023 POCD. Sue Latterette, she's a native of Connecticut. She's an elderly minister for 25 years, served in North Stonington for 12 years, 30 years working with the Habitat for Humanity, and she's been a board member since 2019. Jeff Nelson served on North Stonington Board of Assessment Appeals for 18 years. He has training in international business. He coached tennis, basketball, soccer in North Stonington, and he volunteers at Mesa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am here, president of Kinsa. Uh, I'm a retired. I was a member of the North Stonington Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. That was an ad hoc committee in 2008, and then appointed a member of the Affordable Housing Committee in 2009. And I served as a member chair until uh, 2011. And an incorporator of North Stonington, and, um, keeping North Stonington in accordance. Jennifer Wellborn, she's a board member since 2019, currently teaches chemistry and physics at Wheeler High School, prior chemist at Pfizer, served on the Board of Ed for four years, and uh, served on the Friends of Wheeler Library for 10 years. So I think it, to me, it's, it bared uh, repeating that these are people that have been deeply involved in the town of North Stonington. We're not, we're not a foreign entity. Um, I would like to introduce now uh, Dave Burdo, who is my own town consultant. And in June of 2021, we contracted with him to be our consultant feeling that we needed at this point a professional who had uh, been able to get projects off the ground. So he appointed him. He has 28 years of experience as a housing development consultant and throughout coordinating development of housing projects in town throughout Connecticut, all types of housing, family housing, elderly housing, Needs housing, cooperative, co-housing, co and apartments. Through his leadership, we were able to contract with Patrickin, Patrickin, the architects that we are using. So with that being said, that's our team. And this is why we're here to show you what we want to do.
Okay, it's great, as has been said, it's great to see all the interest here. That's um, really important for something that's, uh, I think, important for the town and probably not something folks are a lot familiar with. I'm David Broca, as has been said, my company, Housing Enterprises, Inc. I started it 28 years ago, really to help small nonprofits develop affordable housing, mostly in Connecticut. Been doing it ever since. And in order to create and have a product for affordable housing, you have to have a local organization that's really working from a mission-driven standpoint. But then it's really hard. So that's where we could come in with our expertise to try to help see all the details for the organization. We need to help the organization do everything we've talked about. And tonight, as has been said, we're going to talk about Moonkachog Hill, which is a property that the town owns. There'll be a little bit of background about it. It's been, we've talked about it in the past four or five years ago and provide some information on where it stands right now from a concept planning standpoint, and then really talk about the process of moving forward to get to affordable housing, which is many steps away from where we are right now. But in order to get there, as we'll see in the presentation, we have to get to a point of having what's called site control, conditional site control, which is a, an agreement with the town through the town and the planning process for the purchase or the lease of the property in the future when the project is all ready to go and the project is ready. But we need that agreement in order to then be able to move forward with all the details that are necessary in order to get to that point. So it's a conditional commitment that we're here to talk about tonight. How's that? Okay. So what we're going to talk about uh, today is the concept plan and then the steps to move the project forward and then open it up for discussion, as has been said. So let's look at where the property is. This is a map from the earlier work that was done with the town at Rendichog Hill Road runs across diagonally across the top and the then there's Wright's Hill, Wright's Road that runs down. You want to turn the screen a little bit? Okay. Okay. Move it up a little. There we go. The uh, large site just south of down from Winterchog Hill that's got some writing in it. It says 163 on it. You can't read that is the property where the property or where the project was planned to go. I'll show a not better plan in a minute. The property below that, that's sort of a square, is where the septic fields would go for the property, for the housing. And to the left of Wright's Road, there's a little rectangle in there. That's just an area for the drainage and retainage and like that. So this is the property that we're talking about. And this is a property that has been looked at by the town 
back in 2019 in the past, and there were some conceptual plans put together back then. Next slide. Okay. In this one, it's twisted, so uh, Rentichok Hill is off on the left and Wright's Hill is across the bottom. But in this one, the original plans were based really on, the, there was a lot of good site engineering done to determine where you could build, where you couldn't build because there are wetlands around it, but not in this area, and where you could put the septic fields, which you can see in this case are off to the left. But this concept here was basically a, a rectangle around a green with very high level conceptual housing around a central green within the area that could be built in. And, and that's as far as it went back then. What we've done since then is be able to work with the architect, Patrickin Architects from New Haven that has worked in this area, work with them to refine something that's more appropriate for the current housing requirements and for the site and for the town, really bring it to the next level of conceptual layout. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. This is that same area. It's a little larger in scale, but it's the same area. And this is a little bit more detail. It still has the housing around a central green. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this from a evaluation standpoint is the roadway for the traffic is centered to the buildings. And then there is not a lot of parking because there's a garage provided in every apartment for immediate access from each apartment from an in-house garage. And you can see that with the little connections uh, around the roadway. This provides a, a nice internal layout, but it provides a very nice visualization from the main roadway because you don't look at a lot of parking area. That's all internal to the building or internal to the the circulation. And then there's going to be additional landscape buffers that are provided. You can see that along the bottom, uh, along the left and the right, there's already landscaping there that would be supplemented. So it was prepared with the uh, look in, into it of how it would look for the public, either driving down Rintichog Hill or even Wright's Road. And this is the way that uh, is suggested from the conceptual plan today. This will all be worked out in more detail later with architectural engineering, the group's input, the town's input. This is just to show a, what we believe to be a feasible starting point to move forward from. The way this is set up from an access standpoint is you come in off of Rintichog Hill at the bottom left there, and you drive down Wright's Road, and then there's a, a circular route around inside of the housing off of Wright's Road. This has 25 apartments which was the same general amount as was planned in 2019, but it's been really looked at to be able to be uh, consistent with the, a better, more studied use of the property. The uh, next slide shows what it could look like, is expected to look like from a side view. And you can see that the, the houses are not just big rectangles really designed to look more like New England housing, even though they are connected because it's more efficient that way. They are designed to look like New England housing. And you can see that 
if you're outside of the housing, you don't see anything except the interesting architectural design as opposed to parking and cars and everything else. This is the, uh, the plan as it's suggested right now. Just to sort of to provide some input on the interior layouts of the apartments, there's going to be some one bedroom apartments and two bedroom apartments and some three bedroom apartments in order to provide the range of housing opportunities for different family sizes. And the next few slides show that uh, this is a one bedroom unit and you can see on the left, the garage is on the right hand side of the left picture and then on the rest of it, there's a kitchen area, a living area and a dining area and a half a bath. And then the stairs go upstairs to where the bedroom would be in this layout and upstairs there's a, a bedroom and a full bath upstairs. But this is conceptual at this point, but it shows how it can fit in the overall configuration. You'll see that this is a two-story building. Most of these are two-story buildings. Uh, the next one is a two-bedroom unit. You'll see a very similar layout on the first floor, but the upstairs is larger so that you can have two bedrooms and full bath and uh, actually a little extra space with this layout. But that's a two bedroom unit. And you'll see that the three bedroom unit looks very similar and that they're just using the space more effectively upstairs for three bedrooms. And those are the general layouts, but all of those have their bedrooms on the second floor, which doesn't work for elderly or handicapped folks. So the next slide shows how that could be accomplished. The left hand picture shows that you could have a bedroom and a full bath as well as the kitchen, dining area and living area on the first floor along with the garage. And then if you wanted to make it a two bedroom, you would go upstairs and have another bedroom or if you wanted to make it a three bedroom, you would go upstairs and have two extra bedrooms. But you could have just a one bedroom apartment and just have the building that's shown off to the left here. And that would be fully handicapped accessible for people that need that or for elderly. And you'll have, as I said, one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedroom apartments as part of the overall plan. That's a summary of the conceptual layout right now. The steps that are necessary in order to get to the point of constructing and having it available are on the next two slides. The first one is really talking just about the first step, which is site control, like I said at the beginning site control because the town owns the property. Site control could be as simple as an option on the property. It could be an option to purchase the property or an option for a long-term lease of the property. That's really up to which way the town would like to go, whether it would like to transfer the property or hold the property and, and lease it for a long-term. As I said at the beginning, Whatever that option was, that option would be conditional. So it would not move to a purchase or a sale or a lease. It would not move to that until all the plans were done, all the plans were approved by everybody and the funding was in place so that the project would be ready to go. Up until then, the town would still retain ownership of the property and would not enter into the actual transfer of property with a sale or a lease. But the conditional agreement allows the group to move forward, knowing that if they can make the project work, they will have a property that's necessary for their uh, knowledge, but it's also necessary for all the funders that are going to be asked to provide money to make this work. And the option 
we'll provide adequate time to do all the next to talk about on the next slide. Uh, because this is town owned property, the uh, process starts with tonight to talk with the Board of Selectmen with the town input on moving this forward toward an option to purchase. And if that's uh, agreed to move forward, the details would be to really define legally the property that I showed the conceptual layouts for, because there's some uh, lot lines and lot adjustments and legal things that have to be done to define the property area. And then an option agreement and the final documents needs to be prepared by the appropriate legal organizations so that the town and Kinsa are good with the wording of those documents for moving forward. The next couple steps in the normal process for approvals of any town property is it has to go to planning and zoning for what's called an A-24 evaluation for planning and zoning being approved. But the plan of transfer is consistent with their plan of uh, zoning and planning. And then because it really is a transfer of uh, rights, whether it's an option or the actual purchase or lease, of course, it needs to go to a town meeting in order to be implemented by the town in accordance with the town uh, government regulations. That's just the first step. But when that step is done, it allows everybody to work on the other six steps here in that the group would then need to develop very detailed plans for the site and for the buildings in order to present them to the town for approvals. This will have to go through the normal town approval process for wetlands and planning and zoning, just like everything else. And those require detailed plans. While those are being done, there would be a continuing discussions and presentations with the town and the government about how things are going so that we could continue to get inputs and fine tune the details with the inputs while the details are being prepared. Once the town approvals are done, then the detailed construction plans can be prepared. Really, what does it take to build this thing, all the windows and the doors and the two by fours and everything else, a full set of construction plans. With those construction plans, it would go out for competitive bidding for contractors, get some competitive pricing for the project. Once the project construction is costed, then the full project funding would be put together with the construction costs and all the other soft costs that goes with it. And that would be presented to the affordable housing funders in order to get the funding necessary to build this. You can understand that this doesn't work financially without public funding because what we showed you relatively expensive to build. It's gonna be nice, but it's relatively expensive to build and the rents won't cover the costs that it takes in order to complete this project. So there is a large amount of public funding that's necessary that will be done as we work through those steps. And then after the project funding is approved, then we'll be able to move into construction. So that's the step, it's steps, it's long, complicated, but not too complicated. And that's pretty much what we had to say so we could have a discussion on the one thing we want to talk about. Okay, a um, couple of things. One, do you have a copy of the package for the, the presentation for the three selectmen? You have it, okay. Uh, secondly, what we'd like to do, Dave, is maybe you and, and I, Mary Ann, could sit at the spa table and use those microphones. And people that want to make comment or ask questions will use the podium. 
And that way everybody will hear what's going on. If you want to come and use the podium, any that make a statement or ask a question, just uh, say who you are, where you live, and then make your statement. Thank you. And you know, 91 Main Street, North Stonica. Um, <clears throat> the whole lead into this seemed to be a foregone conclusion that the use of this property will be for affordable housing. I'm curious what commitments the town has made to support this project in advance of this. And the other thing is, <clears throat> it seems to lack a fair and equitable process as far as how the town's going to take an asset and utilize it. Why, why wouldn't you know? Why wouldn't we do an RFI RFP process? for credible developers to do something like this. So we understand <clears throat> exactly what we're getting and we get the best bang for our buck. Okay, I think your first question was, has the town made any commitment prior to this? No, and this is actually the first time I've seen the presentation. So there's been no prior commitment. I think both the other selectmen went to the presentation on the second floor of the library on June 1st. I was not able to be there. It was my first time seeing it and there's been no commitment. The only commitment was that they could present tonight on June 13th. And your second question? Fair and equitable process. Why, why would we do this? Why would we select one and move forward with it as opposed to put together an RFI process, get a pool of credible developers, vet their proposals against each other to make sure we're getting the best solution for the community and for the town as opposed to, this seems to be stitch the land up in either a ground lease or a long-term commitment purchase by if they get a credible developer and away we go. And it usurps a competitive bid process. Okay, so about three or four months ago, there was a family that wanted to buy some of the property that actually grew up there. And at that particular time, we went to the Planning Zoning Commission for an 8-24 uh, review. And there was, the appetite of the Planning Zoning Commission was not to move the property. Since then, there's been no activity, no the board of selectmen have not been approached up until this this particular time. So with, there's been plenty of things going on in town, and this has not been on the top of our list of things to research. So when this presentation was asked of us to come and do it, uh, like we always do, this meeting's always open to the public to come in and present anything they want pretty much to the town. So I guess we haven't done anything more because at this point we haven't, it wasn't on our agenda and we weren't asked until these this group came in front of us. So. So it's it, it's still an open topic. So if it's something the town has an appetite to proceed with, how we commercially engage is yet to be determined. Well, I think that's why we have public hearings. And I think that's why we have open doors and let people come and speak like we are tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a comment also, um, Gary. I want everybody in the room and, and online to remember nothing happens without a town meeting where you all get to decide what the town does with town-owned property. So everybody, please remember that. I just want to make a personal comment in the fact that when I hear a board filled with North Stonington residents who want the best for the town live in town, that, that's not, not, not all of them, not all, not all of them, but want the best and want to maintain the rural character my only concern is if we open it up to competitive bidding which i'm not saying that we won't or we don't but that to me is much scarier than having a group of very dedicated north stonington loving people trying to plan for housing for all kinds of people and this is marianne knows this is near and dear to my heart my daughter graduated from Wheeler. I've lived here for tw almost 30 years. They cannot move back into town. They desperately want to, and they can't. So it's near and dear to my heart when done the right way with people that have the best interests of the town at heart. So again, remember, nothing happens until a town meeting where you all get to decide. So I just want that out there. It, what, what raised my concern was the sequence of events got pretty far down the road before we got to a town meeting. I mean, there's a lot of water under the bridge for thinking and planning on this before it gets to a town meeting, and, and that concerns me. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a really quick question. Uh, um, Marianne, in your vision that was presented, 
Um, and I know there's different options for the town to either do a long lease, hand over the, the land to Kinsa, but who manages? Would Kinsa contract with a management company to actually run the apartments? And what role do you envision Kinsa actually having in that management? We would not be the managers. We would be hiring a management company. Now, Dave has had experience in developing affordable uh, developments, and he knows the process. And when you when we get funding, then the, then the the um, management company would be hired. Is that not correct, Dave? Yes, that is correct. The uh, property would have a professional experienced property manager running the property on a day-to-day -day basis as far as tenants and rent and maintenance and upkeep and uh, all of the details associated with that. They would be working for Kinsa, who is the owner and has ultimate responsibility, and they would report to and take input from Kinsa. Thank you. Carl Johnson. Carl Johnson, AB Ruder Monroe. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, uh, let's see where we are here. Let's wait a little bit here. All right. First off, the a property you seem to be targeting is town property. It's not really convenient to a lot of people that I would think would live there as far as to highways, to schools, to the um, library, everything else in town. Also, the fire department would have a, a good run to get up there for the fire department. Um, the second thing would be if the contamination from the town transfer station was to drift over to your community well, unless you were planning on running water down to the massive puppets, uh, who would be responsible for fixing that at the end? And then one of the other questions would be the public funding you talked about, would that end up being some HUD money that, that would pick up the balance of the rents to go? And then the only other thing is, did you ever think of a land swap? There's a big piece of state property behind the firehouse that is closer to everything. It's about the same acreage if you were to swap it with them up on the top. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Hi. Um, you know, there's always that dream of the perfect location. And the reality is for affordable housing, you, you get the pieces of land that you can get. For example, one of the beautiful uh, affordable housing unit, um, developments in Old Saybrook called Perry Crossing. It was, and it's gorgeous. I, when I was on the affordable housing committee, we ran a bus and we we toured different affordable housing developments. That development was a brownfield. It was given to the town of North, of Old Saybrook. Nobody wanted it. Old Saybrook then got money to clean it up and then gave it to Hope Incorporated, who was a nonprofit like Kinsa, and they developed this wonderful, wonderful um, affordable housing development. 16 units, all affordable. Um, so, you know, that dream of the land that's perfectly placed, uh, close to him, close to everything, just doesn't exist or rarely exists for affordable housing. So the, the criticism of location is, is to me, unrealistic. It's like that dream location that we want. The, the, um, and what you get is, pieces of land that you can get and develop. So that answers the question of where it is and why it's there. The land was that was given to the town. So the town has um, no investment in terms of cost of land. When it was given to the town, it was given with the letter that said, 
we hope that this can be used for affordable housing. So that was the intent or the wish of the corporation that um, gifted this land to the town. So that's that's my um, that's my answer to the position where it is. Um, as to the fire department, I don't know. Um, we have one fire department, and North Stonington is a very big town. So almost any anyone can say it's going to take the fire department a long time to get to my house. Yes, the fire department may take a while to get here, but that can be said for any part of town. Water, I don't know how to answer that question. Funding, I think, I think Dave can answer that better. It is really a challenge to find the ideal housing for anything, the site location. And as Mary Ann said, you really have to go with what's available. Everybody uh, in small towns doesn't live in the center of town and everybody uh, gets by because that's just the reality of it. That's true in every other little town that uh, I felt, excuse me, as well. And uh, this is a good property. It's been studied extensively already as far as its applicability for good housing. Uh, the question about uh, water and, and contamination, it doesn't matter uh, what you do or where you do it. Anybody that creates contamination that goes on to anybody else's property is responsible for that contamination, but it really takes a lot of mismanagement for anything like that to happen. So I'm not worried about that happening in this situation. Bob. There was a suggestion about land swap in that apparently there's some land near the firehouse that oh might be able to be used instead of this land. Uh, that's something that maybe you know something about, but that's always something that could be looked at. There's never enough land for affordable housing if we... I think I think you're talking about swapping with the state. That is a very complex um, proposition. The state doesn't like to let go of any of its land and I think the town has tried to look at places to put a, fire, uh, a water tower and do some swaps with that. It's never worked. The state is, is not cooperative when it comes to land swaps, has been my impression. What was the question? No. No, there's no mandate, and the, the stuff they were working on over this um, session didn't go through most of it. Um, I just had a question. You referenced a letter um, when this property was gifted to the town. Do we have a copy of that? I couldn't find a copy. Do you have a copy of that letter? That would be helpful because that's the first I've heard of it. I haven't gotten it with my pocket. Great. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Hi, Richard Sloman, 21 Columbia Road. I don't think I need to ask. But, uh, oh, okay. Yep. Hi, folks. Uh, Dave, you mentioned a, a couple of times uh, that in order to get this approved, you'd have to go through the town zoning. Okay. So, paper about two weeks ago at Wheeler Library, it says here uh, if the town doesn't have a 10% housing stock, if they do not, projects with an affordable housing component are not subject to zoning regulations and cannot be rejected. So, which is it? No, no, I, oh, I have more. I have more. So, public funding. I didn't get any public funding when I bought and built my house. That's discriminatory. And what's the requirement? getting a, a lower rent than if they're not supposed to live in the same building. 
vote in Maine. If one person's paying $1,200 a month and another person's paying $1,800 a month, how is that fair? I mean, hell, I might quit my job as a machinist and go to work at Walmart. Right? No, 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 no. Public funding, you know what that is? It's socialism. State socialism. National socialism. You know what national socialism in German? You know what that translates to in German? National socialism? Answer that for me. Thank you. Dave. I'd like to respond to the to the um, statement that I never got any help when I bought my house. All of us that are property owners have um, have a a built-in um, subsidy, and that's when you get to uh, deduct your mortgage payment from your income. That's a subsidy, and we don't we don't realize we don't realize and appreciate what a subsidy that is. And um, it's a fair subsidy. It was instituted to promote home ownership and it has done that, but we take it as our right and not as a gift. It has been a gift to all of us who are homeowners. We have been subsidized by, a, by being able to write off our mortgage payment from um, our interest payment from our income tax. So I just wanna set that straight. We have all been a recipient of our government uh, funding. I do just want to remind everybody, we are neighbors. I'm going to ask everybody to be respectful and understand that everybody has different opinions. So please respect for everybody's differences of opinions. This is exactly why we're here to talk all this out. Dave, did you want to speak on the last speaker? Uh, yes. The question about zoning always comes up with affordable housing because there is a state statute called 8-30G that says if a town does not have 10% affordable housing and North Stonington does not, then if a developer meets the requirements of affordable housing in that state statute, and if the planning and zoning department denies the application, it can be taken to court in appeal and the courts will uphold the application unless there is a health and safety issue. That is the state statute. That is not being proposed here at this time. This is being proposed to work with the town to find something that the town wants and sees a benefit to, to the town in accordance with the affordable housing plan that the town spent a lot of time developing. It's been established that affordable housing is desired by the town and this group is trying to do that. And by part of trying to do that includes working with the planning and zoning department to find a way that this can be approved without having to go to court, but can be approved by working together. As far as uh, rents are concerned, as I said, this project uh, does not work financially. It costs more to build than the rents can carry. The rents will be established for different income levels of different families that have different incomes depending on their income from where they work. And the rents will be established based on those income levels. And it is correct that people will pay different rents for what looks like the same apartment. And that is by state desire, 
because the state knows that different income levels need affordable housing that they can afford based on their incomes. And the state is willing to subsidize the construction costs of those that are paying lower rent because they know it costs more subsidy because the rent is lower. So that's all just part of the overall process moving forward in order to make sure that people and families and individuals of different income levels have an opportunity to live in town according to your affordable housing plan and an opportunity to do it at the different rents that they can afford. So that's part of the details that will all come later if this is something that the town wants to do. Okay, Mr. Brunot. My name is Adam Brunot, I live at 166 Finish Hog Hill. I just wanna mention that I happen to be on the Wetlands Commission town here. I recently received something uh, from the head of the commission the state is or is trying to pass a bill called HB 6781, which seeks to eliminate any protection of wetland and waterways for affordable housing. So it kind of struck me when I was thinking about this project, this particular project. If you don't, if the affordable housing committee or affordable housing entity wants to take in the you know, build a structure such as they're showing here. They won't have to go possibly through the local government channels. Also, I noticed when I looked up the property itself at zone R80, which stands for Rural Preservation Zone. <clears throat> this uh, R80, the zoning district extends throughout the northern three quarters of town, includes most of town's reserved open space, agriculture, numerous scenic and rugged topographic features worthy of preservation in its natural state. So, how does this fit within that zone? Ask myself. Why are we not gonna follow the rules? And if that's the case, then the property owner and taxpayers should not follow these rules as well. What I have to say, trying to figure out how is this possible for affordable housing to just bend all the rules that we have to follow. Thank you. There are a range of bills out there having to do with wetlands. I don't know the specific details of this one, but I do know that there is talk about changing the wetlands rules that um, it's going to, whatever happens is going to happen. But what I really want to go back to is earlier speaker that talked about the state statute about affordable housing because anyone that wants to do affordable housing, whether they're from the area or not, and they wanna do something that you don't like, can come in and take advantage of all of those rules that are specifically set up for affordable housing. Whereas what you have here is you have a local group trying to do something that's the right thing to do and work with the town. I think that's an important consideration. Thank you, next speaker. Just really quick, that bill that you referenced about um, wetlands did not make it out of session this year. No. Good evening, I'm Steve Lamar, I'm 14 Fowler Road. And just a couple of uh, food for thought or topics, at least from a safety perspective, and make sure that, again, I have this, uh, my arms strapped here on this. Is there only one access for the road that people close? Is this, this is a dead end road, essentially? Is that so? So if we think about that and, and mirror off some of the discussions from a, from a fire perspective, I think that's something that should certainly be considered. I think that this road and an increase in, in 
additional traffic if we consider each of these residences to have two cars. I think we should really look at the, the worthiness of that building and whether or not you know that, that, that level of impact is sustainable. I think that there's some other considerations that uh, that, that we should also have in mind on this. You know, we are going to, you know, this is an area that, you know, that, that continues on with their proposals. Um, you know, we really need to be mindful that we're talking about percentages and the state's got some percentages and we're, we're looking to go satisfy, a, you know, or, or accommodate and, and, and hopefully find a solution to this problem. When we're talking about really small percentages, oh, it's, it's 10% or this percent or, or, or others. How big of an impact is that if there's only two or three houses on that particular road or other residences? That's not a 10% impact. That's a six, I think I heard somebody say, maybe, I'm not sure, but that's much more than a 10% impact. Um, if there was a, a situation or a fire or a rescue type situation, that road could be blocked. It's inaccessible and there's no other points of entry. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that that certainly would be something that we would consider other alternatives. Or, um, and, and one last question. I noticed the wetlands that are all the way around this particular property is the idea that we would go bring in a specific amount of fill to make the drainage and to make the the uh, septic system and well and, and you know, whatever, whatever it's gonna take to go make this worthy buildable project. Um, if if we have to bring in fill, I'd like to know how much that is, because I know that there's limitations for others. And again, we would be we would be doing for one and not for the other, or or holding you know two people to two different standards. So I know that if I wanted to bring in 400 yards of fill at my place to go, you know, do something or, or level something out, or, or you know, I know that I'd I'd have to certainly go. Uh, you know, meet the meet the requirements for that, um, and I'd like to know if we're just being bold if we're moving on campus. Great, thank you, Dave. I think you are more familiar with the engineering on this, because we have had some of that done. Uh, yeah, I probably am. A, I am an engineer in my background as well, but I won't. Uh, I won't go into details that it's a nuclear engineer, but I won't. We won't. We won't use that for this project. There's been uh, other projects uh, in Connecticut in the rural areas where there is uh, one access road to a number of properties. You even see that on uh, single family homes. That's always a concern. That would be a concern here. That would be something that would be looked at from an engineering standpoint and a health and safety standpoint and work with the town. One of the things that has been suggested is there may be a secondary access point directly out to Winterchuck Hill so that there would be a secondary access point from a safety standpoint. That just hasn't got to that level of detail yet. Those are all the things that would be looked at. As far as disturbance of the wetlands. There's not any intent of disturbing the wetlands. The wetlands are outside of the disturbed area. And what I showed on the earlier plans, the septic fields are in another area to the right, the way they were showed, that is also not wetlands. So this would be worked in a way that reserved and uh, did not do any long-term disturbance to the wetlands and maintain the wetlands. That's the plan. One of the things that's um, happening here that's that's a good discussion is these are all questions that, of course, will be looked at later as we get to that level of detail. One of the things I want to go back to from the beginning is the process and where the town meeting is in the process. The town meeting is in step one. There's only two steps before the town meeting in step one. And all the other things that I talked about, steps two through six or seven, those all will not begin until there's a town meeting and the town has agreed to move forward uh, with the option to uh, proceed to the next levels. 
Another speaker? My name is Daniel Lowney. I live at 56 Holler Road. I've been a town resident for uh, over 38 years here. And I've got a few questions, uh, not only relative to this particular proposal, but just uh, in, in general, the uh, relationship of this proposal in this effort, the efforts that the town's affordable housing committee has undertaken. I've not heard any, any interface here with the town's affordable housing committee, what they've done, what they're doing, how they interface with this program, this project, where they stand, what their charter is relative to finding affordable housing. It seems like this is a private endeavor that's moved forward with a proposal, absent, and maybe not absent, but not visible to me, what's going on relative to the interface with the town's affordable housing committee. So I'd like to know what the relationship is there. I share some of the same concerns that people have about the best use of the property. Uh, I'm not sure how well vetted this has been. Uh, and I recall that it wasn't more than two or three years ago, I, re I recall that uh, the town was pretty close to signing a 100-year lease with a, with a uh, group that was going to put an animal shelter up there. That seemed to just evaporate. Not to say that that wasn't a good or bad, bad project, but uh, that seemed like that at the time, that seemed to be a good use for the property if we, if we could move forward that far to get to the point of almost signing the lease. So I'm not sure where this fits and why we changed direction there. Uh, so the other thing captures some of the, the I think the, uh, the sentiment of some of the people that I share, and that is impacts. And there are school impacts, tax impacts, environmental impacts, economic impacts, financial impacts, infrastructure impacts associated with a project like this. I haven't heard any discussion of when or where all those impacts are going to be uh, assessed. And it seems to me that it's earlier in the process than before a town meeting that they should be vetted, discussed, and presented to the town for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, Marion, comment? That's uh, why I tried to talk about the evolution of keeping North Stonington affordable in the beginning, that it was part of the 2013 housing plan, which the Board of Selectmen accepted, and then it was incorporated into the 2013 Plan of Conservation and Development. And in that plan, one of the objectives for the housing uh, committee was to commission, was to establish a housing trust that would have to go through the town and ordinance, et cetera. That um, objective segued into an, an independent um, affordable housing 501c3 that could work directly uh, on uh, building uh, affordable housing. And that was, that's how uh, keeping North Stonington interfaced with the, the affordable housing committee. Now, since the committee has evolved in, in uh, membership, and some of the um, some of the direction that they've taken is is a little different, or maybe the same. I don't know. We haven't. I I have to tell you, um, getting this up and running, all of the pieces that we've had to put together, hiring a consultant, hiring an architect, has been very time consuming for a really relatively small amount number of people and so we haven't uh, been able to also facilitate uh, a relationship work hard at facilitate facilitating a relationship with the housing committee however it's not that we're hostile to them nor do i think our goals are any different than their goals it's just that the way we approaching the uh, need for affordable housing is very direct. And, you know, with the capability of being a 501c3, we can seek the funding. They can't. So we've been really busy doing what we can do. And so that's why 
you know, that, that's how it all came about. So I think that, I think that's clear. It's clear in my mind. It always comes up. Okay. Brian? Okay, Brian Rathbun, 263 Grindstone Hill Road, North Stonington. I've been in town about 65 years now. I moved in, or my family moved in, and my own father, when, when we had half of the amount of people in town, about 2,500 people. Uh, one thing we learned very quickly is, is that North Stonington was basically a bedroom town, they called us. But we're very proud of our land that we had and we value our land that we had. Uh, that's one thing I think North Stonington's got to keep in mind about any, about giving up any town land that we have. I don't believe we should. The 830G that you heard about has been in effect since 1989. And out of 169 towns, is only about, I believe, 31, between 31 and 40 towns that are able to reach this imaginary goal of 10%. That goal is not carved in stone, although the state keeps wanting to raise it. I look at it this way. Um, I'm on the Affordable Housing Committee, and I believe that the state since it's been 1989 and not many towns can abide by it, they ought to revisit that statute. And isn't it funny how the state of Connecticut doesn't want to give up any of their land. They want us to give up our land, the land that we love, the land for our animals, the land, the land that just has natural forest. The, uh, Winnichog Hill was voted on, I believe, twice and voted down. The zoning board recommended that the town keep that land and not sell it to a private entity that wanted to buy it. The KNSA has land, has land down in Cox Falls. KNSA has land over on Trolley Lane. I haven't seen what's going on with that yet. I think we ought to let them deal with that land before we even consider giving any more land to it. Another part we gotta look at, we just built a big school over there. Now, I don't know what the total capacity of that school will be, more houses, means more kids. Is that gonna make us over capacity? We gotta build more schools? I'm a little nervous about that because that's gonna come on our taxes. Our taxes are very high right now. People wanna argue with me, they can. Stonington is lower right now. The value of 10 acres of land, just think about that now. How much would 10 acres of land cost you in North Stonington? And you want us to give it away? I don't think so. It's valuable. Land is valuable. I think we all know as homeowners here, how much we value our land, whether we have a small parcel or a big parcel. We're an agricultural town. As far as I know, I've been on the, the, the Affordable Housing Committee and first I heard of this was over at the library the other day. I heard tonight that the first step is to send it to a town meeting, but no, I say the first step is for the selectmen to hear all this, discuss it and decide if it warrants going to a town meeting to continue. I want to urge them not to send it to a town meeting and stop it right there. 
simply because I love this land in town. I don't want to see houses built. Stonington built all those houses over there and they still haven't reached their 10%. I don't want to see it happen to our town. I like the bedroom town. I like the way we're living. I like our farms. I like the forest. I like the animals. I want to see it stay the same. So please, when Ms. Leckman talk about this, please take that in consideration. And uh, like I say, I was here very early and Kings of the Meadowood came in. The state doesn't allow us to count those houses because they were built before 1990. If anything, I would like to see some money pay and fight this whole affordable housing thing with the state and get together with the other towns and take it to the Supreme Court if we had to. That's how much I feel in my heart about North Stonington. Next Thank speaker. you, Brian. I want to uh, say that I've heard your your uh, point of view before, and I just want to rebut it with people need a place to live. When you move to town, when any of you move to town, you found a place to live that you could afford. It is becoming harder and harder and harder for people to afford to live here. And we are getting to be an older and older and older community. We need we need the vitality, the uh, diversity to keep our town alive. This is what happened in Essex. Essex got together, they formed Hope Incorporated, and they said, we need help. We need help of a younger population, and yet there's no place for them to live. And they started to build affordable housing. A group of local people, just like us, just like us, Kinza, and, and our supporters, said, we need to keep our town alive. We need people that will help us to do that, that don't have to travel long distances. And they, they have started to build affordable housing. They're the ones that built uh, the, the lovely um, uh, ferry crossing in Old Saybrook. It's people, we just have to look beyond ourselves and what we want and say, what's good for our community? What, what, what are the challenges we face? And we face the same kind of challenge that other towns have faced and they've taken action. And they've taken action with a group of local people. And that's what we want to do. So, you know, I've got mine. I don't care if anybody else has, has any. Is not our motto. Our motto is providing a hometown solution to what we see as a, not only a state problem, a local problem, but a national problem. People need a place to live. Marianne, can I just ask, do either of you know currently right now what, um, let's say a single family home, what constitutes affordable housing? How much is that home right now in order to qualify to be affordable housing? Dave just got, he's showing me this, um, this grid. He just got it today and it answers that question, I believe. So go ahead, Dave. It provides the input toward answering your question because what you are asking about is really uh, home ownership sale price for home ownership for affordable housing. Affordable housing is generally defined as an individual or family whose total income is less than 80% of the area median income because folks above that are able to uh, compete in the open market. And if you look at the situation for a family of 
four in North Stonington, 80% of area median income is almost $90,000. So the sale price would be based on what can a family up to $90,000 afford to pay for a home, including principal and interest mortgage, taxes, insurance, and operating costs. I don't know the answer to that. It's changing because interest rates are changing. And every time interest rates go up, the uh, ability to purchase a property, the sale price goes down for the same monthly costs. But it's probably in the range of from what we've seen in other towns, 250 to three hundred thousand dollars but that's for people at that high end of that income people below that it's at a lower level thank you and it seems that uh Iran. i have just okay sorry just we're just we're trying to get through the okay, okay. thank you hi i'm meredith bernat i live at 166 winnichog um when we moved there it was a very quiet rural area beautiful um with the winery coming in um with the dump it's becoming a very busy place but my question is um who who has paid so far up to date for all of this work that is coming into um the design and you guys going on the property if it hasn't reached the first step and is it are you looking to build something similar to like a spruce meadows or brookside village in stonington and what is that going to do to the town in the long run i'm all for affordable housing but why is it not on route two where things are more easily accessible uh are the ride share buses going to come for those people who can't afford to have a car? How are they going to get to their groceries? Wouldn't it make more sense to have something of this nature, which I think would be beneficial, but in a more area that's suitable than a back country road that's quiet and peaceful. And again, the whole safety as far as the comings and the goings and, you know, one way in, one way out, the, the wetlands, I just think there's a lot of mixed bag into that and it would be more suitable on a main road that's more accessible. Well, I think we answered that before. There's always that dream location. And um, that dream location usually means a quite high price tag and affordable housing cannot be built cannot be affordable if they have to pay a lot for land. So many towns, as in Old Saybrook, they gave this brownfield to Hope to build affordable housing, which they did. And then the town went, after they gave it to them, then went to get the funds to clean up the brownfield. So, you know, sad to say, affordable housing cannot move in and afford the cost of that prime location that's all privately private land nobody's giving us anything the only thing that kinza has been able to access is land on trolley lane that was given to us uh 119 uh clark's falls road the old schoolhouse was given to us so we we can't afford to go out and build and and buy expensive nicely perfectly placed land um they can't and afford to do this project now as it is and number and your question about uh people not having cars people who don't have cars won't be living there i mean everybody in our town and there are many people that fall into the low income or very low income, everybody has a car. You cannot live here without a car. Do you know anybody here that without a car? I, I don't. I do actually. Do you? Yes. Well, they're few and far between. So that's that's uh, you know the location question is is you have to deal with land you can afford and 
to build affordable housing, you have to get land free or or at very reasonable. So what other plots in North Stonington that do you have access to other than directly across the street from my house that you can build affordable housing in? You mean on Winnetog, mm -hmm. on Rice Road? Mm -hmm. We have no other land except those that I said, Holly Lane. And so are you going to do anything with the existing properties before you try to encroach? You know, what we are always trying to do with Dave's help is scare up the money. And how do we afford doing what we're doing? It's by uh, citizen support. We don't have any funding source that says, here, look out, look for what you're doing. We have people who truly believe in what we're trying to do and they give us money and we are a tax exempt organization and they can take it off their taxes. So just like you might give to the cancer fund or whatever, they give to Kinsa. That's how we afford what we've done. Okay, and the answer to the question, what funding have you used to get to this point? I think that was the question. <laughs> You've used your own funding for that. In, in going forward, if this were to proceed, who's funding all of it going forward? You and Tony? When this has the ability to move forward, we will be able to attract public funding, public affordable housing development funding in order to move forward with the design and then of course, to move forward with the construction there'll be local fundraising to the extent possible but the reality is we have to go out and we have to get basically state funding in order to make this work and the governor signed the budget yesterday i think and it has a lot of money in it for affordable housing and this is the opportunity to move forward with that opportunity what was said a few minutes ago is really important here is that this isn't being done because there's some state statute or there's any private vested interest. This is being done because the town has said that it's important and it's important for the vitality. It's important for volunteers. It's important for the long-term health and the other thing that I see all over the state in the small towns, this is becoming important to businesses because they can't hire people. So this is really about what does a town want to do that they see as a benefit, the way I look at it. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Jen Wellborn. I live at 754 Pendleton Hill Road, and I am on the board of Keeping North Stonington Affordable. I wanted to be sure you knew that. I, when I knew that we were going to be presenting tonight, I was reflecting upon what I would like to share, and I really have two things. I am privileged to be a science teacher at Wheeler High School. This is my first year. I've been a teacher for four years. If, if I had to on my own salary, I could not afford to live in this town. I make about $64,000 a year as a teacher, and, and I would qualify for affordable housing. I think teachers are better when they live in the town. I think people who help run our town government and provide services are, are part of our community, and they should have a place to live here. So I think it's very important that we provide housing that people can afford. So that's really what motivates me to be part of this group. The second thing I would really like to encourage everybody to do, when I moved to Connecticut 30 years ago, I started working for Pfizer. As an engineer, my job was to help solve problems. And I think what we have here is a challenge. I appreciate Brian's comments about the beauty of this town. I really don't want to live anywhere else. But we have a challenge to try to find the solution in the middle which is how can we provide housing for people who desperately want to live in a town like ours? We have a tremendous school. We have tremendous personnel in that school. I would like to help us all together find the solution in the middle. And I would encourage you all to think about helping us to solve that as well. 
Let's be problem solvers and try to find the way together to help this town change because change comes. We really can't expect it to not change, but let's be in control of the change. That's what Kinsa wants to do. We want to, as a town, be in control of how this affordable housing unfolds. So I would really encourage you, please, to help us do that together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Next speaker. Hello, Lisa Mazella, 247 Sadak Hill Road. Um, first, um, I just wanted to uh, to thank uh, the members of Kinsa for your dedication and your commitment to um, what you believe in. Um, this committee is made up of individuals who are deep rooted in North Stonington and who have volunteered prob collectively probably tens of thousands of hours. So whether we whether anyone either uh, agrees with their mission or not, um, I think it's important to recognize their commitment to the town and and for them doing speaking up for what they believe in. So moving forward with my my understanding of affordable housing is it's not the same as low income housing. It's different. Um, to me, um, what I struggle with is I feel like we have affordable house, affor housing that is affordable in town, uh, whether it's Cedar Ridge or Kingswood or whatever. However, the definition, the state definition of affordable housing is different with that 830G. Um, what I appreciate with what Kensa is trying to accomplish here is that we have site control. So it seems to me that at, at this time, that the state is the arbiter, not the town. And so we're, we're presented with an opportunity to control what's going in there. We do have to go to planning and zoning. Any developer could come in and um, say, I, I'm doing an affordable housing project, and I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that any developer that comes in, at least 30% of their housing has to be affordable housing, and 70% can be the regular market. But it'll look like something that we don't necessarily want. So until that changes, I would rather, rather than have a developer go to planning and zoning, and we deny it because we don't want what they want to put there, they'll go to court, we'll pay for the attorney fees, and they'll win because of 830G. I mean, that's where we are right now. Unless the state changes that legislation, that is where we're at. So we have less than, we do have less than 2%. Um, and I know 10% seems like, you know, a magic number, but I just feel, feel like it's it's really important for whether you agree with the affordable housing the way the state has it or not. Um, approach with this approach, it is in our control. Um, and so that's what I think is is important to hear here. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, I would like to know how many one level apartments would be in the plan um, for elderly or disabled people, or would every how many units would be um, two levels? The plan we have right now is purely conceptual to show how it could work feasibly. The question you're asking is an important question that would go into finding out the details for that. There is the opportunity to put one level apartments at the end of every one of those clusters. So you could have a significant number of one level units there, depending on the desires of everybody's input as those details are worked out. Okay, thank you. Now, who would own the apartments? The ownership of the apartments would be with Kinsa. 
they would uh, develop it and they would continue to own it uh, as part of their mission. And as has been said earlier, they would hire an experienced property management company to manage it from the day-to-day -day operations, but the property management company would report and be under the supervision of Kinsa. All right, and one other question. So if Kinsa owns the property and, and owns the units, would Kinsa pay property taxes? The state statutes for affordable housing do not allow tax exemption for affordable housing, even if it's owned by a nonprofit. So the ability to the, uh, establish the property taxes would be established just like every other property in town by working with the town and the assessor to establish what the proper property taxes would be. Okay, thank you. Lisa, I just wanted to address one of your statements where um, you mentioned that if a developer came in, we denied it, we went to court, we would lose. I don't think that is the case. Um, there are a lot of factors with that. So if you refer back to the, I think, December, October um, affordable housing uh, session that they had with uh, Michael Santoro from the Department of Housing, who spoke on affordable housing, he actually is one that said the 10% number was an arbitrary number, came up with the 80s. In the 80s, there isn't uh, a big way right now. Now we know there's new legislation that they keep trying to put in to enforce that. But in a rural town like ours, he said 10% doesn't always work. It, it yeah. works I on said, base yeah, that I, town. I did say it was a magic number. Yeah. Average. But he also said that with a fire department like ours, with volunteers, with not having a ladder truck, things like that, that safety and security is a reason it gets denied and that does not win in court. So assuming that it automatically, any developer would come in, it is, is not accurate anymore based okay. on what he said. And then if you look at the new legislation that they tried to put in, um, and I don't know if they, they some of it went through because they, over the last what two weeks, they <laughs> mixed a lot of different things in, but that was something that they were looking to do where it would bypass planning and zoning if it was 20 units or lower with access to sewer and water. Okay. So I, that was something the state tried to-, to I was saying that because I, I maybe Pat can help, but um, there was a planning and zoning meeting a few months ago where an attorney was there and, and, and advised the planning and zoning that, um, that they pretty much you have to approve it or you go to court. And was it I our attorney? Was, was it our attorney or the attorney representing the other people? Pat, were you with were you with attendance at that meeting? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, well, then I'll just reiterate that um, moving forward this way, it would remain in our control of what, what yeah. the right we would that, want to look at. I appreciate it. I just don't want people to no, think I'll that it automatically. Minutes. I'll would. look for those minutes anyway. Yeah. But, it's a video. Um, you can find it right online. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that we can all work on a solution for, for the town. But I, I hate when I keep hearing that somebody can come in, build whatever they want and it goes through and we lose in court because that's really not. That's what, what was said accurate. at a public meeting. That, that was said by an attorney. Well, every attorney has an opinion until it goes in front of a judge, right? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Next, please. Oaks, Wrights Road. Um, I, you know, if you guys take over the farm, um, do you know if it's even buildable? Who did the survey? Uh, the plan you show, you show the suburbs of the U.S. Cross and what the and the value across the street. So it's a first look at what the culture is like. And if we've done whole cost of assessment and get back a subsequent, and all this work, 
And if you do go into it, say the plan doesn't prove it, do you start a new work at all? Do you just say, you know, because we broke this up, something happens within the four-year term, and it's not feasible, we just put it back to the plan. But what you touch the property, such as cutting trees down, doing something like that, who's going to take that back? If we just left back off, why you build that? Affordable housing, why it's going to prevent all zoning going to where it is. Two story units going to these two types of units because they don't have the zoning for the four story units. So I don't know. Can you answer those questions? And I'll tell one quick thing. Why should we have that? Like those nine. The engineering that was done was done uh, under the review of the town three or four years ago when it was being looked at and a very qualified civil engineer did all of the detailed work that was shown on that first plan that I showed prior to the concept plans that we've developed here. And uh, it has been looked at from a wetland standpoint uh, you are correct that there would be a modest wetlands crossing to get the septic lines across a wetlands uh, corridor in order to go from the place where the homes are to the place where the septic fields are. But that's a modest crossing that would then be restored. That's not unusual to do it that way. The, uh, the detailed engineering would be done in more detail and be brought up to date as it goes forward, if it goes forward, or I'll say when it goes forward, we'll see. But could it go off of uh, Wintichaud Hill Road? It possibly could. And I think we mentioned that earlier too as a possibility. The challenge, the difference in there is that it appears that there's a wetlands corridor that would have to be crossed in order to do that whereas dirt road is already um, a passable road that would just be improved. But those are all possibilities. You can, you can in fact, cross wetlands if you do it carefully and appropriately and uh, preserve adequate wetlands in relationship to it. So these are all uh, engineering details that would be worked out. As far as the question of when would INSA do any work on the property other than testing, they would not do any work on the property until all approvals were done and all funding was in place. So there wouldn't be a threat of doing something earlier that would not go forward. Thank you. Denise. I'm Denise Hall. I'm from Maine's Crossing Road. I'm also on the PINSA board. Um, and I wanted to come up and just um, share my support of this um, plan and, um, and encourage the town to um, really consider moving forward um, on it. Um, but I wanted to just kind of share my personal uh, perspective as to why I chose to participate in affordable housing um, in town and why this matters to me. Part of just my personal core values is, you know, whatever success I have in life, I always look to who can I also help to, to achieve that success? Who can I help to help those who might be struggling or um, having to overcome different challenges? Because I know personally in my own life that there were certain um, things that I didn't know, um, access to information or to opportunities that my parents didn't have that they couldn't teach me about, that I didn't know. And so I want to share with people who might not have that opportunity to have historic knowledge. And in particular, um, to me, affordable housing is an opportunity um, to right a historical wrong in terms of discrimination. And I wanted to just share um, something um, briefly, just a, a one example. Um, <clears throat> so going back to 1934, President um, Frederick Roosevelt um, signed the National Housing Act into law on June 27, 1934. 
The purpose of the law was to encourage improvement in housing standards and conditions to provide a system of mutual mortgage insurance and for other purposes. The law created the Federal Housing Administration and the Federal Savings and Loan Ins uh, Insurance Corporation. The bursting of the housing bubble of the 1920s was a major contributor to the onset of the Great Depression. By the summer of 1932, as many as 1,000 mortgage defaults were being recorded every day. And by early 1933, about half of the nation's home mortgages were in default. FAAH, um, FHA regulations were responsible for the standardization of the 30-year low-interest mortgage. Um, <clears throat> so this was something that was put in place because there was an obvious need um, and the government stepped in to help people. Um, <clears throat> Then, a 1939 report um, estimated that the um, FA, FHA helped 12 million people improve their housing conditions, but the benefit was out of reach for millions more Americans. In his 2017 book, The Color of Law, author Richard Rothstein um, called the FHA um, a state-sponsored system of discrimination that was primarily designed to pro provide housing to white middle class, lower middle class families. The FHA um, refused to insure mortgages in African American neighborhoods and required homes built by FHA loans to um, be sold only to white families, a policy known as redlining. And so there are historic injustices that have happened in our country, laws that have been passed from generation to generation to ensure that African Americans did not have access to certain things um, that others in their community had. A lot of people weren't a part of making those laws, but they did benefit from the fact that they didn't get to have that, that line drawn. For them. And um, that's why communities look the way that they do. That's why there's so much segregation still um, widely throughout um, our state, throughout the country. And so um, these efforts are efforts that um, I applaud because there are efforts of, to Marianne's point, of not just looking to myself and what I have achieved and um, just wishing everybody else well, um, but to think about, okay, what are some of the realities that might be some legitimate realities that might be hindering people from accessing something that I have and what can I do as a fellow neighbor to love my neighbor and to help them to um, to access some things that they might not be able to access because of the legacy that they have been left with because of things that have happened. So that's my heart behind this. Thank you for the initiative. Thank you. Are there any comments online? No, I have the comments in the audience. Are we hearing and seeing none? Uh, Bill Ricker? I thought you had to catch a plane. Bill Ricker, 421A, Wyasip Road. We did move here some 25 years ago. My wife, Marianne, president of Kinsa, and I, and tried to immediately get involved in our adopted town, a town that we hope to spend the rest of our life in, by volunteering. We indeed have put thousands of hours of volunteer time into trying to provide a town that is accessible to everyone. I appreciate the turnout tonight from folks who are both supportive of affordable housing and those who have serious questions about it. Ultimately, select woman order said at the very beginning it's going to be up to the townspeople i hope in a referendum rather than a town meeting where one side or the other can stack the decks and call out their minions to come and vote for or against it correct a couple of things that were said earlier 
there was a town meeting where it was not voted down twice, but it was voted for affordable housing at that town meeting uh, by four votes, only to have a paper ballot done uh, some five or 10 minutes later where it went down by two votes. I've also looked, uh, uh, Brett Mastriani, I've looked for that letter that uh, I can't find either. But when I was selectman, uh, the first selectman uh, present tonight read to us the letter that accompanied the gift of that property from that uh, corporation in Indiana. Uh, they purchased the property as we understood it, uh, hoping that uh, the tribe would get tribal re uh, federal recognition. And then they were planning to use that property for uh, another casino. Uh, when that did not get realized, uh, they then had that 109 acres and gifted it to the town, getting it off their books and onto ours. And in that letter, uh, Mr. Mullane will uh, support that uh, it stated to be considered for affordable housing or a portion of that property. There's 109 acres, give or take, in that uh, property. And just about 10 acres is being considered for this project. You've all heard the pros and cons. We heard them. Many of you uh, who spoke up, thankfully, at the library. Uh, and here tonight, we've heard the pros and cons of uh, where it should be located. It's too far away from uh, the fire department. It is approximately four miles from the uh, fire department, closer than those of you who live over on Fowler and Grindstone Road. Uh, it is just over a half a mile from the uh, Foxwood Casino to the north. The septic system and the inland wetlands surrounding it have been assessed and nothing will go in there without uh, the health department and the state's approval. Folks won't be renting in that facility if they don't have cars. But what's most imperative is to have a community that has a balance within its community. Those of folks who are able to afford large acreage farms, we are a farming community. We support that farming community, but we also need housing for the workers. If I did not put money away in my retirement, I could not, with my pension, afford living in this town. I'm fortunate that I had the foresight, we had the foresight uh, to be able to afford living here, but many, many cannot. Our seniors cannot downsize and live in this town. Two of our neighbors up on Lyasset Road have lost their husbands and have been looking to downsize and cannot find anything in our town and reluctantly have to look else, elsewhere. Our kids cannot even rent in our town at 2,000 and more a month. Our municipal workers, I believe every one but one or two would be considered for affordable housing given the salary. Wright's Road can be widened, it can be chip sealed, it can be addressed. And I did bring up your point that you mentioned to me at the uh, library about trying to look at access off of 
of uh, Winter Charge. And it was a very good idea and it is being looked at. There is a small part of the wetlands which would need to be crossed, but I believe that, that was addressed earlier. Folks, we've heard all the pros and cons. There may be a couple more that have not been yet addressed, but the long and short of these arguments are, we need the support of our town government. We need the support of our population if we're to have affordable housing. And ultimately, I hope it will go to a referendum. So as many townspeople who are willing to show up and vote will have their say. And that's how we will decide whether affordable housing will come to North Stonington or we continue to lay ourselves open to a predatory development. Thank you. Uh, no other questions online. Is there any other questions? Pat Lewis, were you trying to come up to the microphone? I couldn't tell. Is there anybody else hiding behind the corner? Oh, you? Okay, thank you. I'm Pat Lewis, Bloombridge Road, North Stonington. Um, I've been on zoning, planning and zoning for about 10 years. And, uh, and this is not really in relationship to zoning, but um, we, uh, I do have a couple things I'd like to mention. Um, in our last POCD, we did mention Meadowport, which was a uh, planned affordable housing development on Route 2. It was um, with a stretch along where Chelsea Rotten is. And <clears throat> it got approved by zoning, but it never materialized because there was a deed restriction. By the time the deed restriction got changed by the attorney general, the developer was no longer interested in building. So um, planning and zoning has approved everything that's come before us. Uh, the, the, as long as water and septic uh, is, has been met and there are no other safety <coughs> issues, we really can't deny anything. We pretty much have to throw out all the other zoning regulations. Um, that's the state law. <clears throat> um, regarding the, the property up on <clears throat> on Winnichog Hill, when it was bought by the development corporation, they paid seven hundred thousand dollars for that parcel. And <clears throat> my concern now is the Eastern Pequots are still trying to get recognized. It was turned down, but now they're starting again to try to get recognized. And so I'm concerned about <clears throat> what is the value of that property up there? If, is it worth that amount of money now? Or is it worth a, a building lot? So I, I think um, that's an issue that needs to be resolved and concerned about before we turn over any land that <clears throat> if we get rid of, maybe the Eastern Pequots development company or, or, or it, and it's, the, the land that was bought was not bought by the Eastern Pequots. It was bought by a development company that again, because the Pequots didn't get recognized, um, they, <coughs> another company turned it over to the town and give, give to the town. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention, so again, I'm concerned about the value of that property. Um, is it worth a building lot or is it worth a lot of money if the Eastern Pequots try to get recognized again. And Brian um, has been very involved in affordable housing. And another, another way we can meet our quota is by <clears throat> first time home buyers getting um, CFA, CSFA loans. Those count towards that 10%. And we really need to push, if we can get more buyers of houses in town, um, and pretty much a, a lot of people qualify for CHF more CSFA mortgages as first time home buyers, as long as they have a job. Uh, you really don't have to have a huge income. But, and Brian's done a lot of homework on that and he's had a couple of in-services about it and we need to really push that more because that does count towards our 10%. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pat. Another speaker? I would just like to comment on some of those comments. Uh, CHFA is a great program and it's great for people who qualify. The issue is there aren't a lot of homes to buy under CHFA. They have to fall into an affordable, an affordable uh, range. And the second issue, yes, they do qualify as a, uh, in our count of affordable homes. But the second issue is, suppose I qualify, I find a home, I buy it under a CHFA um, loan, and I move on. I get a better job or I whatever, and I can sell that home at market rate. So that affordable designation is not deed restricted. That that is lifted. Uh, suppose I buy for two hundred and forty thousand. The market goes up. I get a better job or whatever. I can sell that at market rate. Maybe it's three hundred and fifty now, and it is no longer deed restricted affordable. So. That's a number that comes and goes. And I explained that to somebody recently, and they said, why don't people do that all the time? Well, it's not easy to find how homes, I don't know, they do do that. I mean, that's that's legal. So yeah, CHFA is a great program, and people do take advantage of it. And then they move on and sell at market rate and it's no longer affordable. So so that's that's the issue with CHFA. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, Linda Smith, Wrights Road. Um, I just have one question and then one comment. And I think we're probably gonna, if we go forward with this, I'll have a lot more. So we'll be first. My question to you is, we, we mentioned that this is especially necessary for retirees, for luckily teachers, which are my granddaughter's teacher right here, and your daughter, people who might want to come back, farm workers. How do you plan on, on ensuring that those are the people that will be renting in these apartments? Isn't that discrimination? I mean, how are you going to get the people that you want back here and not just people to qualify. Everything that's done here will meet all the state requirements for fair housing and equal opportunity and equal access. The household incomes and the associated rents are a range, like I said earlier, a range of different family organizational sizes and layouts and incomes, and then their rents are set according to that. The qualifications are based on the standard qualifications for being a tenant and then meeting the income limits for the affordability. That sort of by itself provides the opportunity for that class of people you're talking about, whether it's retirees or teachers or other people that have modest income jobs in the area, that sort of is just set up that way to allow those opportunities for folks like that. In order to qualify there, just like anywhere else that's a rental, you have to be able to show that you can pay the rents. So you have to not only fall under the income limits, but you have to be able to show that you have adequate income to be able to pay the rents and you'll be a good tenant. So it's set up that way, just like everything else, but with a range of uh, income limits and a range of rents that go along with it for that range of uh, types of families and individuals we've been talking about. But that doesn't exclude people from other towns? I mean, we have, you would have to look at people from the surrounding towns, right? Not just people that want to come back to North Estonia or people who are working in North Estonia. How do you ensure that that's, those are the people that are going to be living there? 
someone wanted to come back to Mills Shonington, they are not living in town now. They would be moving oh, into so town. So you're saying they would have to be actually living in town at this time to qualify to live there? Uh, I no. Your answer, so. No, the, the uh, opportunities for housing do not have any geographical limits. Mm -hmm. But people that would want to live in this housing um, would very likely want to live in this housing because it provides an integrated benefit of living in North Stonington for a lot of other reasons. Okay, thank you. And my comment is, um, if I could repeat everything that Brian said, I would, <laughs> but I can't remember all that you said. But, you know, I was driving down um, Wright's Road the other day and this big buck came out, a little bunny rabbit and a big buck. And he just looked at me and then he slowly crossed the road. And while you were saying what you were saying, that's all that I could think of. We walked down the road. The smell isn't of gasoline from a bunch of cars. It's the fox. It's the coyotes. It's the owls. That's why I bought down Wright's Road. Um, a lot of that is going to be taken away from us and not just Wright's Road. Where will it be next? This isn't, this is just the beginning. So kudos, thank you for saying what you said. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one online. All right, we have um, a hand up online. Sean. Online, you can speak. Uh, yes, this is uh, Sean Murphy. Well, can you can, hear me? We can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I just joined the meeting late, uh, so possibly this was already answered. But at the library meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was stated that uh, keeping North Stonington affordable, their goal was to seek the property for a given period of time, and then be uh, and then be allowed to uh, be the town to donate the property to them for them to develop is that is that changed no that was still part of the presentation okay at at this time uh and, and i'm wondering why the town what benefit is it to the town uh not to determine what we want uh for the space uh and basically go out for uh uh, an RFP to solicit from uh, any developer that might be uh, interested. And the reason I say that is I noticed that the two properties that keeping North Stonington affordable uh, currently have, uh, they no longer pay taxes on them. And I was told at the meeting the other night that, that North, keeping North Stonington affordable would be paying taxes. What good would it, this development be for us if indeed it was going to be in uh, owned by keeping North Stonington affordable and them being uh, a charity organization? And so none of this development would be uh, eligible for taxation for the town of North Stonington. Is that is that not correct? Uh, that isn't correct. Well, it was answered earlier by uh, David, the, com um, the consultant, and he mentioned that this particular property would be taxable. Uh, why would that be if the current properties that they own are not taxable? What would make them different? I'm going to ask Dave to answer that question again. The other properties are not yet developed and don't have any developable inherent value. When they, they they have the land value and they're not even paying taxes on the land. I'm not uh, going to dispute that because I don't have the facts on that. But the other properties will be sold, the small properties you're talking about, they'll be sold to a, 
affordable homeowners. And they right. When, when those are sold, that there's some benefit to the town. But if keeping North Stonington affordable is going to, for the, uh, the Winnetalk Hill property, is going to keep it in their name, uh, then I don't, I don't understand what's different, uh, why they would suddenly be responsible for paying taxes and they're not today. I, I, and, and the town basically gave keeping North Stonington affordable, the property, uh, the old, the old, uh, schoolhouse, uh, about a year and a half ago and bypassed someone that would have been, they bypassed a higher bidder uh, that would have been responsible for paying the taxes on it. And if keeping North Star they've had it for a year and a half and we yet we haven't seen any uh, development of that property. Is there a reason we... I'll answer the question about uh, why um, there's been no activity is that we had a funder and then it was discovered that there was a deed restriction on that property that it could only be used for educational um, purposes. So we, when we um, discovered that at, at the closing, an hour before the closing, we discovered that and the town discovered that. So at that point, we invested quite a lot of money to get that deed changed our lawyer was able to go to the um, go to the state, and the state then deemed that the charitable intent of the that deed would be satisfied by Kinza developing affordable housing, developing it into affordable housing. So after a year or more of litigation and and whatever with the state and and the town was a part of that litigation um we were able to clear that deed and because we were going to use it for a charitable intent that is affordable housing now why hasn't anything happened well unfortunately a grant that uh we worked very hard to put in was not accepted so you know now we have to find the money as the town would have had to find the money to preserve that that um, structure which we very badly want to do but that's the reason why uh, it could not be sold to an independent bidder who was not a charity because it had to fulfill the charitable intent of that deed which was 1840. So, um, so that's your answer. And do you do you pay taxes on that land now? No, we don't. There was Thank you very much. That land, uh, no taxes were being paid on that before when the church owned it either. So, that right, but they would have been if Mr. Palmer had it. Yes, but he could not because the deed would not have allowed him to own that property. It could only be used for a charitable intent. So could the town own the property? Could the town own it? The town yeah. could and did own it, but there was no need. The town saw no need to keep it, and that was voted at a town meeting to uh, get yeah. rid of the, um, the property. And then we tried to buy it at that point, our bid was was accepted, and then the whole deed issue came up. So that had to be resolved, which kins of resolved. I mean, we've spent a lot of money on resolving issues with land. So yeah, that, you, know, just, so you uh, can't uh, say you can't say that we've left the the issue fallow. I mean we work keeping yeah. it. Now we're working on getting money to restore that property. That property yeah. needs a lot of work. And whoever had it, town or an independent, if they could have arranged it, would it would need a lot of investment 
to make that livable. But we're hoping that that can happen. So, Sean, to answer your question, when we come back with the uh, with this to the town after the board of select and do a lot of research and do our own investigating and get answers to these questions, uh, we'll have a definitive answer whether that will be a taxable or non-taxable project to the town. Yeah, because that it surprised me that uh, they current currently weren't paying taxes on it, and uh, uh, I don't see the difference. You know, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mary. Sean, one of the if you look through why nonprofits are exempt, there's multiple reasons why they can be or not exempt. But one which might fall for this one, the only one that I can see is unused real property owned by or held in trust for a nonprofit may be exempt if it's unused because there's no suitable buildings for the nonprofit's purpose, but the necessary buildings or improvements are under construction. Um, and that's from Connecticut General Statute. So that might be why the properties that they have are not taxable until they become affordable housing. So. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Dar Daryl wasn't able to uh, clue me in on that, but that's, that makes it uh, more understandable. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. The Fox Falls Schoolhouse um, had a deed restriction for educational use. There were two other bidders. One was over 25000 and the other one was about 6000 And the town sold it to KNSA for a dollar. Um, so I, I'm... It's educational use I saw in the deed. It didn't say anything about charitable. Okay. Uh, it's all, just... all I can say is that we had to get that deed um, modified, and that's how we did it. Thank you. Um, okay, so aren't you all glad we did this in the beginning of our meeting and not the end? Uh, we'll be here for a little while longer. If you want to stay, you're more than welcome to. So I think from now, our next step is the Board of Selectmen will take everything we heard, um, do our own research, talk to town attorneys, and get all the answers to the questions. If there's other questions, we'll present those to KNSA, and there's a process to follow. So we'll follow the process. Uh, we, as a board, want to get as much input as possible on any subject we're speaking of. Um, I don't believe that three people should decide on how a town should move forward. I think we should have as many voices heard as possible, which we will. Uh, so bear with us. This is not gonna happen overnight one way or the other, but the big thing is when it does happen or not happen, it has to be what the town wants to do. So thank you for coming this evening. Those who wanna say feel free. Did you wanna say something, sir? Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't see you standing there until the last minute. Doug Redmond from uh, 108 Bowell Road. Uh, I just want to clarify something with the uh, vehicle ownership of the people that are going to be living in uh, affordable apartments. Uh, apparently, with the current administration of the White House, they're going to be doing away with fossil fuel vehicles. They're going to be required to have electric vehicles. What's next? Affordable housing is going to be followed by affordable vehicles. Electric vehicles aren't cheap. Understood. Thank you for your comments. Oh, I appreciate it. All those, thank you for coming. And uh, those who want to leave, we'll take a two minute recess.
Thank you. What, you want us to turn the air conditioning on now and pay for that? It's too early in the air. We've had two warm days in Aluro, big air. So are right, we going to call this meeting back to order? What I want to do is we'll do additional appropriations. That'll only take like a set couple minutes. Then I'd like to make a motion. We move, since Kosh is here, move discussion on number 10, animal control officer discussion up after appropriations since she's been sitting here for quite a while. And that's okay, we'll do that anyway. So uh, with that said, so additional appropriations, um, you see there's two now. Um, the first one is on the quarterly. So we talked to the Board of Finance during the budget season. You know, we talked about cutting the quarterly as far as their funding for the budget. And then at the 11th hour, the Board of Finance saw fit to put it back in because we know what it's going to cost us. So right now, it comes out quarterly, and we have enough money to do it under the under the guidelines we use now, not using the school, using the printer we use, and so on, and the additional pages. It, it costs us, we have to pay for four quarters. And right now, we have usually enough money in the budget to pay for three. That's why we raised it this coming year. But we're still in this year, not next year. So we told the Board of Finance we'd probably be going back into in for an appropriation, and that's what this is for. So the total number of dollars is $2,226. That will be going to a future Board of Finance meeting to ask for. Any discussion on that? Is there any question on that? I just wonder why we wouldn't move this until after the Animal Control Officer discussion in case there was anything else. What you want? I, I think you can do it. You, we can we can come back and add. Okay, as long as that's acceptable. Yes. And there's only one other item on this, Christine. You want to explain the second one? Yes. Um, so uh, for recreation to finish out the year, they're looking for their program line, um, which is B sixteen point zero one program expenses for recreation, uh, ten thousand dollars for additional programs. This is to cover the um, spring soccer program. Um, we never received the invoice from Groton for the winter basketball program and for the after school um, small camp that we're running. So those program costs, which people have already paid for, are going to cost about $10,000. We are offsetting this with revenue. Um, we had projected that we would get about 70000 in revenue. Um, the total as of yesterday was $72,746. Um, so... We just need this additional appropriation, which is offset by um, revenue for programs that people have already paid. If you find that you think we're going to have a larger discussion, Brett, I don't mind tabling this and moving to animal control. No, I mean, I mean that might we might have to just revisit, but I'll make a motion to approve the two as they are right now, so we can move the discussion. Okay. So I hear a second. I'll second. Great, thank you. So just with the rec program, so these are, I understand the process. I'm just curious, did we not budget enough or was enrollment higher? All of the above. We didn't anticipate having the after school camp. Okay. Um, we've had uh, the drama programs that were not in the, so throughout the course of the year, we've had new programs added on that were, not okay. help, help, that were not part of the budget when we started 
a year and a half ago looking at what was going to happen for this year. So um, numbers are up. People want to participate in the programs. We're getting new additional programs added on. Um, you know, we have a lot of different offerings for different people in the community. And it, it's not a bad problem to have. I just right. wish there was a different way for us to, right. to go about it. So, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Do you ever see this happening again next year? Or we just passed another budget? I, I realistically honestly think this is going to happen every year. Mm -hmm. I think that we get new programs. We have people that, that approach the rec department about wanting to offer new programs that we didn't know about six months ago, a year ago. And why would we tell people no to not be able to offer things for the community? Do all the new programs offset with revenue or not? Yes. They do. Yes. So when they all offset, I don't mind. Yes. But if we're if we know up front we're going to a budget, it's dishonest to go in with a budget you know you're going to ask for an appropriation no. later. Our, so, so say someone came up tomorrow and said they wanted to teach basket weaving. They would charge $50 per person. They would get paid out $50 per person unless they're holding their program in our building. And then we have an administrative fee that we hold on to as a department to help offset the utility costs for the building. So everything has an offset. The only programs that aren't revenue neutral are our play our summer playground camp. And if we tried to make that revenue neutral, we would we would price out our our patrons. Right. Um so so we take the what we take the ten thousand out of um the undesignated, we pay for it, we they get their revenue and we put it right back in undesignated. Correct. Okay. So as long as it's a net zero, then I'm I'm good with it. But it just seems like if if we know we're gonna do this every year and it wasn't net zero. I think we have to come up with a better plan. And so. we are just voting to move it forward to Board of Finance. Yes. Okay. And they, I, it looks like we're probably moving their meeting to the 28th um, because the 21st is graduation. And um, with parking conflicts, schedule conflicts, I think we're probably going to move their meeting to, okay. to June 28th. Okay. So it is, I just, want to reiterate it is budget neutral for anyone listening so it's not okay. we're spending another ten thousand uh the only thing i would like to add and i mentioned it at the rec commission to christine is i think maybe we should research some kind of administrative fee so we have one if they use the rec building but there is a cost to us to allow everyone to come in and run a program now some of these people that run program make thousands of dollars by running these programs through North Stonington, yet we are doing all the paperwork. We pay for the website. We pay for our, our accounting generalist to issue the 1099s to do make sure the money's coming in and going out. So there is a cost. I would like us to look at possibly having a charge to the uh, small percentage to these entities that run the programs. Outside entities, not our own. Yeah, they're mostly all outside entities, but the summer program and a few other ones. Yeah, so Brett's not talking about um, the the fall soccer program or the in-house basketball program or any of the, or even the Groton basketball program, any of those, but those independent instructors that approach us and say, I want to hold a what are you volleyball camp. What are you thinking for? I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe Christine could. Yeah, I mean, the, so REC has been about developing lots of um, policies for different, different administrative type thing so um we'll put it on their agenda for their july meeting and we'll and it sounds like a reasonable request to me oh absolutely we're doing all the administrative so okay um we have a, a first and a second uh, any other discussion none all those in favor of moving these appropriations to a board of finance meeting for approval say aye aye aye, aye. okay now i motion that we take um number 10 animal control office discussion Move it up to uh, in front of number eight and behind number seven. Seven and a half. <laughs> uh, do we have to make a motion? I motioned. Oh, you motioned? I'll second. Great. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Animal control officer discussion. So we know where we were at the last meeting, and, and we've done some research and uh, talked to the town attorney, talked to the labor attorney. Uh, and Christine, do you have some information that, uh, since you were in the meeting with me, just yeah. to alleviate any of the hour of that? Can we just give a little background based on what we're looking at? Okay. So, because um, that was in executive session. So we, some can't, of this we can't talk about what we talked about in executive session. But so we, a brief summary of what we're going to talk about. Right, yeah, what, go ahead. What we are going to talk about is based on um, hours of the position of animal control officer, 
um, we are discussing the possibility of moving that to a, a full-time role for North Stonington. That's the basis. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Um, so after conversations with our new labor attorney, um, basically we can't look at the position as a salaried position. She has to get paid for the hours that she works. We need to track the hours that she works. So if we think she's going to be working 30 hours a week, then we can keep the salary where it is right now. If we think that she's going to be working 35 hours a week, then we need to increase the salary. Um, so currently the salary is um, $24,354.37. If we were looking at 35 hours a week, we would be increasing it to um, 27,300. And if we think that she's working 40 hours a week, then we'd also need to increase that accordingly, which would be 31,200. Um, if we are offering health insurance for this, we have to make it comparable to all of the other positions that we have. Right now, we have non-union employees and um, our two collective bargaining units. Uh, this position would be non-union, so it would be at the same rate as the majority of the non-union people. So right now, that's 10% of that the person contributes to their benefits. And then so the town would be picking up 90%. Um, and what we had budgeted for the upcoming year health insurance um, using those numbers, the total number for health insurance without the contribution is about 40,000. So the town would be picking up 36,000 and the employee would be responsible for that 10%. So with the, isn't in the new budget 27,534? That includes the assistant ACM. Okay. So what, what is it right now? $24,354.37. Okay. Now, I'm curious to see why the labor attorney would say it's the hours work is if she's not exempt now, because that position's not exempt now or exempt now, why so, would it change to exempt? Because technically, it, it's to be overtime exempt salary, you have to be an executive, administrative, or professional. Those are the only categories that are exempt well there's a test you could do and you, a lot of it is making your judgment calls making decisions so there are a, there's a full test which is the town's labor attorney gave us this advice so that i'm just okay. telling you her so answer. then that makes me worried by that advice that that position that's been working over a certain amount of hours that we've been paying we don't have on. tracked data that shows that we've been under the assumption that she's been working 20 hours or less a week Right, but it, okay. I guess we can just move forward from this. Point. So based on 30 hours, because that's our threshold for benefits in correct. town, correct? Yep. Um, where would the, the salary for this position have it to go? It would stay the same. So the 30 hours, if you divide the 30 hours with the current, current salary, it keeps it above minimum wage. It's $15.61 an hour. If you go to 35 hours or 40 hours, divide it then it, you have it, you have to raise the salary right and that's based on the 15 dollars an hour minimum wage if we want to pay the position more than the 15 dollars right. an hour minimum wage then we're going up from there so i did see the average for is about 20 dollars an hour from what i've seen in other towns but there is a range um i just worry that what we base it on so if based on what we've seen and from the log book we're averaging about 30 hours a week total time. Does that leave room? You're going to have to pay her for what she works. So if we think it's going to be 30, then we need to budget at 30. If we think it's going to be 35, then we need to budget at 35. If we think it's 32, we need to budget at 32. But, town, but she needs to track time and we need to. The town labor attorney did say that they you will have to track hours because if we're paying you that way, it has to be tracked. It can't be an option. It, it either it is or it no longer. That's that's so and what she, is so if it were on call so if she's on call half the time and she has to go in for 15 minutes, is that 15 minutes of time or is that an hour of time? It's 15 minutes of time. How would you go in for 15 minutes? I mean, when she does a call to someone. I, I don't know. I'm just wondering. It's strange it's strange to me that the labor attorney would recommend this after being being exempt for so long, this role. And based on my research that I mean, I, I yeah, but you're it, not a labor attorney. That's I'm not, but I, I I've talked to a few HR di directors actually in the past few days about this, and 
looking over the, the rules on exempt and taking, there's a test you can take and it, it comes down to how many decisions you make and, and. Uh, so we're not trying to shortchange anything. We're not trying to avoid paying. We, we wanna be as fair as we can. We have an employee that's asked to go in a, to a full-time position. So we're, we're talking about it. And there's also a benefit package that goes with that. It's never been that position in our town. So we're trying to do the right thing by by going in that direction, Brett. So it may be we have to do something and then adjust it somewhere down the road. If we do it and we think we're doing it the right way and we find we made a mistake because we're not tracking the hours correctly, we're not paying for enough hours, then that, then down the road we'll have to make an adjustment. But we have to start somewhere. So one thing I will say, so we have a, an employee on staff right now who is budgeted at 40 hours. So uh, our land use administrative assistant, she has to be at the inland wetlands meetings and the planning and zoning meetings. So she works outside of the normal schedule. She's budgeted for 40 hours. Her typical work week is 35 hours so that she has the flexibility to go to those meetings. So we budget her at 40, but we pay her what she actually works. So some weeks she may work 35, some, works, some weeks she may work 40, she may work 37 and a quarter. It's all based on how much she actually works, but her so, minimum is 35. So do we have to decide, we have to decide how many hours we are gonna, we are estimating that this role will work. Mm -hmm. um, so what I heard you say is if we keep it at, if we say it's 30 hours a week, that then qualifies for benefits, which I hear you say it will be an additional 36,000 at what we budgeted when we, with the estimates that we had at that time. Okay, so 36,000, um, but the pay would not change, you're saying? It wouldn't necessarily have to. We are meeting the, the legal minimum wage threshold, but that doesn't mean you guys can't do something different, but yeah. just staying within the confines of, of labor law. Okay, so one more time, if we, if we decide on 30 hours, the pay stays the same, and it's an additional 36,000 for insurance that we would have to go to the Board of Finance for an appropriation. Well, we, or are we, do we have savings from insurance no. someplace else that we talked about that might offset? So I thought that um, based on, we don't know where benefits are at the end of the year. So if it's a benefits question, that's right. we don't know where they are by the end of the year. So we could go to the Board of Finance at their next meeting and say, hey, this is our intention. This is what we're doing. And we might have to come back to you at the end of next fiscal year yeah. because the benefits, Maybe. somebody's were more than others. And that would change if we had to do, I mean, you could do the same thing if the, the pay changed, but I think it's probably more appropriate to, if you know the pay is going to change, then budget it. So I would, I would wait. So technically, we're doing additional appropriations for the current year. So I don't know that you can ask for an additional appropriation for the budget that hasn't has started, even yet. started okay. yet. Okay. So I would say you approach them with your plan, tell them this is what you're planning to do. And then once we hit July 1, if there's anything that needs to be requested, that would be the time that you would request it. Um, there's also, once this position goes full time, it's pension eligible. So that's an addition, additional um, amount that might need to be added at the end of the year. Same thing, you can, can hold off thing for FY23 or no? You won't need, to, this oh, would no, all this start, it all started to right. So um, this is the same thing. You could wait until next June, July, see if there's additional, uh, you know, if, if we've had other transitions that impact the pension line, you may be able to just fold that in. So what you're asking is, until after July 1st, go to the Board of Finance and, and tell them our plan is to wait until later in the year, see how things are tracking, or do you want to go for an appropriation sometime after July 1st? Um, so if it's if we're if we're looking at benefits only and not adjusting the pay, I would just go at that next meeting because I would like if we're doing this to be effective June, I mean July 1st, um, to happen. And then if if I, I guess we monitor, right? So if all the hours are are going great. I, I just worry about a 15 point, what was it? $15? 15 
that uh, seems no i agree it seem it is it is low but i i'm concerned about having to go back to the board of finance and ask for this now where let's write the hours let's make the hours what they really are and and see and and track them and see where i mean are we estimating kasha do you think do you think 30 hours is reasonable okay so the some might be a little more some might be a little yeah. less okay and so 30 hours it comes out to a little bit less a little more than yeah 1561 yeah so and, and so, so i'm way above right now july 1st <laughs> yeah much. but i am in agreement with you that i think when we're doing the 25 budget that it yeah. absolutely needs to be addressed yeah. i'm just concerned having all of this happen now right after we pass right. the budget I agree. so i guess i would like to make a motion to make this a full-time position based on 30 hours a week at the current rate i i second that starting july 1st starting july 1st we're gonna have to go to the board of finance yeah. just to let them know what we are doing. does it have to be after july 1st why can't we just get on the agenda to say Barry, we, 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 <laughs> why can't yeah why can't we just get on the next agenda wherever they can fit us in and just be open with what our goal is and what we want to accomplish and go from there. They're meeting on June 28th. So I, I guess my the, the only reason I say that is what if there was a huge pushback from them, which I hope there wouldn't be, but if there was and saying no, we're not we wouldn't give you that additional appropriation at the end of the year to cover those benefit costs. So, that's the only thing. But if, if, I mean, if but that's that's the risk. I mean, right. that's the process we go through. We make our case and there's a man in the back that wants to say something. <laughs> well, can you say it from the microphone? So my only fear is that it looks very similar to what the Board of Ed did last year at the end of the year with the business manager. And they went through the whole budget process and at the very end, they came back with a raise. In there. Well, I mean, I, I think that we just, we, we're honest and we explain how it all came about it, yeah we it, didn't it, have this information i should yeah. say that we didn't we didn't have this as a board this information yeah. prior to the budget and i think it's the right thing to do well, when, i'm pushing that for a minute but <laughs> when we hear that someone is working 30 hours which is our benefit cut cutoffs benefits. and yet we're really only basing their pay on 20. So for how many, for how long has that been happening? Yeah. And I know prior administrations didn't want to really jump on this, but I think it's the right thing to do because legally we might have had to do something for not taking care of it sooner. Barry, you have something to say? Yeah, I, I can't speak for the Board of uh, Finance, but I, you know, let's just write the wrong people's claims. And if at the end of the year we're running favorable, we do the appropriation, it's no never mind, right? It can't. We're doing the right thing. We're writing the wrong that's been wrong for a while. That's my opinion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Okay. So, so we so we move it we move it forward to the board of finance then. Well, we're not, well, we're no, not asking we for have. appropriation. We're that's just right. we're okay. just asking so we're, we we're, we're telling them what our plan is. Okay. Okay. And then with this, Christine, you'll come up with uh, how the time's accounted for and that kind of stuff. Um, and then make sure like our, whatever those job duties are that we know of and that the state reporting, the paperwork is all done um, with this extra guarantee. Was there a time frame that the labor attorney told us to keep track of the hours? To give us I a, think we have to do we have to do it weekly like everybody else. So it's not just to get an average; it's from here on out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now we have. I know I get on my desk three employees every week that I gotta go sign off on their hours. Christine gets everybody else because she's the admin, but I get 
or if the tax uh, town core if they need funding zoning, DDZO, I have to go through their hours. So this would fall into that category that probably would go into Christine, it, but she'd have to look at the hours each week and sign off on them. It, it, I feel like it, it should come under you to sign off on them, just because if you look at, like I said before, at all the other towns, this falls under um, division of police. But it doesn't fall under that in our town. And we have resident troopers. So I would say that since she's the admin, admin director, why would we change that? Okay. I mean, to me, it doesn't, we can both look at the sheet. <laughs> and we both see the same numbers, but I like to have the admin do her her job. Okay. So, all right. Anyway, that's uh, anything else? One more clarification too. So town employees, do they clock in? Or they write it on a sheet. I'm, they, I'm just asking for my. So they all clock in, except for those who can't clock in. But we those, town hall employees all clock in. Okay. Right. So this would and be garage, like a little, town garage employees clock in. Yes. So you work up like some kind of log that for timing. No, we literally have a system. No, I'm saying for this position. I'm thinking we might just add it to the system because you can do it right from the phone. Yeah, you, you don't have to be, you don't punch a clock anymore. Like you have an app, you hit clock it. Like when I pulled in the parking lot, I hit clock in. And then when I get back in my car to leave, I'm going to hit clock okay. out. All right. I just wanted to make sure that nobody had to drive to town hall nope. to clock in and then go. And, and, and there's no more. Punch, there's no more. Punch okay. Clock. All right. Yeah, there's, we will there's have to change technology. We will have my mind. snap on my phone. We will, <laughs> Kasha, we will train you on how to do that. And if you get it half as good as the guys in the town garage, then you'll be also. Brian Rathman. Sorry, you should sit closer. Those who use the microphone a lot, so you should sit over there. And, and he hasn't eaten supper. I haven't eaten. I think that's the key. And I'm sweat. It's hot up here. Go ahead. You want me to go turn the air on and we pay for it? Wait till a hot day. Go ahead. Sorry, Brian. I'm, I'm very supportive of this because I know Kasha. And uh, I'm just wondering if she gets a call at midnight. No, it's not double time or time and a half. No, it's time. And be, if she has to go get a cow out of somebody's garden, she would do it. And she would do it. she would do it. She would do it. She does. Important person here. Treat her right. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. That's why we're that's why she's on the agenda. We have not voted yet. No discussions. We vote I mean on the first two appropriations. I thought we voted on those. No. No, on this. No voting on on making the We had a motion. Vote. It was oh. second in July one. discussion. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Now we vote. Are we done with that discussion for tonight? Okay, Kasha, we're done with that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, and I agree with both right or wrong, and yes, you are very important to the town. Okay. Gosh, I can't talk about it, but what we've been going through, what you've been going through in the last two weeks, I can't thank you enough. All right. Moving on. Oh, transfer station sticker sales. <laughs> and if you have more than we're not changing, and you only have to pay for one. Okay, so uh, you both saw my article. I think we're getting it kind of get cut and dry now. Uh, we are at Mr. Mastroni's suggestion, at least for the first time, we'll see how it goes. We'll do ticket voucher sales at the transfer station on the first Saturday. We have a cash register. It's about this big. We'll be fully trained. I know. I see it on every time I go in to do checks. I That's see it on Ivana's the desk. It's a way of training on it. And I'll what make sure day are we talking about? It's the, if you don't count the first Saturday in July, which I think is the first. Correct. The next three Saturdays. And what I'd like to do is we don't need to walk work all three, but we would need to work two out of the three. So it would be me and you, me and Brett, you and Brett. And and no particular. So 
I can work all three if I needed to. So if someone can only work one, that's fine. Or pick one the Saturdays that you think you don't have plans, like you're not going away for reunions so, and yeah. you're not going out on the boat. So I am. This is um, your idea to sell this on Saturday. I, I, know, so. I know. So the 8th and the 15th, I can absolutely do. I ha would have to check on the 22nd only because I do eight, think No, 8th and 15th is good. I okay. just covered so but I, But I, if I'm home in time, um, then I will do the twenty second, but um, right now I'll I'll do the eighth and the fifteenth. Eighth and the fifteenth, and we know at least the eighth is at the transfer station. Okay, can we talk about this for a minute? Sure. I have two concerns with selling it at the transfer station. One, you're selling it one day a week at the transfer station, and all the other days you're telling people they have to come to town hall. Two, it is an issue with cash controls. We are having someone transport town money in their personal vehicle back and forth from town hall. It should not be leaving the building. Um, so I just need to voice my concerns and my strong recommendation that we only do it at town hall until it transitions to being full-time at the transfer station in September. I understand your concerns. And when you say in a personal vehicle, if I have to drive the town car, I will. And if I have to work all three weeks, I will. But we, right now we're only agreeing to do transfer station the first week. See how it goes. I mean, it might be awful. It might be great. We might say this is the best thing. We should be here. Or we might say this is totally a mistake. We shouldn't be here. So I understand what you're saying because being the administrator and understanding with funds, there are not, we're out of the controls. I think the cash draw has to be counted before we leave town hall and kind of when we get back from town hall and the money put away properly and checks and balances on that. If I have to work all three weeks, I'll do that to make sure that happens. But then again, we need to, well, actually, we should have two people count the money before and count the money after, just to make sure everything is on the up and up. I'm not worried, but we should do it so it's very transparent. Um, I guess we'll, one of the concerns is the logistics of where we are at the town hall. I assume we're going to be behind the back. Yeah, so if someone's at the gate and they're saying, okay, um, you don't have a sticker, I, you haven't bought one yet. You, have, you can go Monday through Friday to the town hall or on your way out. The two of the selectmen are at the back gate. You can pay then if you have exact change and they'll give you a voucher. All we're giving is vouchers, not stickers. We're not putting stickers on vehicles. We're giving vouchers. The guys working at the transfer station will put the sticker on the vehicle. Well, why wouldn't we just put them on that day? Because we're not doing well, Oh, they can. They can drive it back around and get a sticker. But on. why wouldn't we just put them on that day? Because we're not putting stickers on it. We, we, we want one guy putting all the stickers on it. Because then after you put the sticker on, they have to write in the book. When they, they're they're going to have their own book. But see, I think the easier but this way, we, if we they make have, it for if people. We, no, we, if we give them a voucher. What's the difference if we give them a voucher at Town Hall on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the next time they go, they show the voucher, they get the sticker put on. Because they have to go back in line again. Why wouldn't we just have that person do the stickers that day? If, if this just, is a special... And then they gotta go around again. Why don't plus plus the stickers are all num they're all in num numerical order. They have to be put in a book with the license plate. Why would we have the book going back and forth between us and the? You know what I mean? I'm just saying those that day that we're there. Why wouldn't we just put the sticker on and do the book? Ourselves? If we're doing them the, the, the favor of being there and selling a voucher, they go home with the voucher. The next time they go to transfer station, they bring the voucher. See, that's, the that's where we disagree. What, the what's the big deal? No, I, I just don't, when you say we're doing them a favor, I don't think we're doing a favor. I think this is about public outreach because there are going to be a lot of, and that's why I, I pushed for this to be at the transfer station that first time, at least because there will be a lot of people with questions. We're the elected officials. They'll want to understand it more. They might we're reaching out to them because it didn't go great the first time this was ever done. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible for these people that just come that might not read the newsletter or not might not know that it's happening, but then we can address that as we're there. I agree with what you're saying. Done. We can do all that. And and I agreed, I disagreed in the beginning when you said let's move to the transfer station because it's all set up at town hall. Why are we going to move it? But I compromised that we'll move it for the first week to see how it goes. Now, you're going to have to compromise because I don't think we should, if there's people put stickers on, there's people sell vouchers. I don't think the person selling the voucher should be also the one putting the sticker on. It's just, it's two different jobs. And but there's the, going to be three of us there, right? So what? Let the person who, if the transfer station guys are putting all the stickers on and they got them all in numerical order, 
Then let them put it, put them on. Be, the stickers are always there. The vouchers are always in town hall, except for this Saturday that we're going out. So do we have extra staff on to help this in the yeah, month of July? Yes. Well, yeah, Charles is being is reassigned to the transfer station. That's his job. Right. So can't he just be down there with us and put the stickers on? Why give him a voucher? It just then seems like a Because then he's not item. at the gate checking proof of residency and everything else he's supposed to be doing. But we, we don't do that now. No, so that's part of it. So, but that's what he's so starting. Part two of this. I told Donnie yesterday, I think it was yesterday's news, said there's two ways we can have a meeting on the Thursday before we start. Either I go deliver the message, you deliver the message. And the message is we have to do compliance. If when if I get right. one phone call that says, hey, I saw a Rhode Island plate with no sticker, I want to be rest assured that he was checked out with a proof of residency. If I go up there and I see a Rhode Island plate with no sticker, and I say to the gentleman, can I sort of see your proof of residency? He goes, oh, I'm only there. Someone's getting written up. And I'll go by the union rules. But there'll be write-ups, there'll be put in the file, and there'll be suspensions if there has to be. The compliance is a major part of this. I'm not charging him for a sticker and then him seeing a guy from another town being in there. So I'm going to go deliver that message the Thursday morning before we start this on that Saturday. So if Charles, or he, if he's the, the keeper of the gate, we'll say, he can't be down putting stickers on with us and being the keeper of the gate at the same time because they're not we're not not gonna be next to each other. So my feeling is we sell the voucher just like it is Monday through Friday at town hall. They can drive around if they want to have a sticker put on that day, or they just bring it back the next time they come to the transfer station. And you may have people that come on Saturday to get their sticker that have already paid at town hall. So if they're coming with their receipt from town hall and you have the stickers and they have to wait for everybody else to buy their sticker when they already came to town hall and bought their sticker. Or you just say, get the sticker on the way out. I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking it's, it seems like an extra step that. It's not an, it's, it's not an extra step. It's, the extra step is we will, we're going to be a town hall to make it easier, but I don't want to screw up the people putting the stickers on. If we, why, we're already changing by moving the cash register to, to the transfer station for a Saturday after we said it's going to be a town hall. We're selling a town hall for the first month. Now we've just changed that. Well, honestly, when I said this at that first meeting about doing it at town hall for the first few weeks. I mean, doing it at the train. I said doing it at the train. I've never said town hall. Okay, that so, was, but we don't just, want. I'm just saying. But if, if that's the case, I'm not going to argue. I mean, over do we want 200 step? cars piled up on, on Winter Child Road because we're doing stickers and vouchers and, and it's just on a Saturday? It's just crazy. So, this is like streamlining the process, which is why we'll be at the end, not at the beginning, at the gate. If we want to be at the gate, it's just going to make the. Car. Oh, I agree. The being at the gate. Oh, yeah. No, the gate is would down be below. So, to, give, to, to give the person a voucher and say, you have two choices. You can either go around and go, I'm not waiting in that line again, or bring it the next time you come. Because they're going to have the stickers and the book. That's all. And So do we have, um, so we would have something that proved that they paid for their sticker because I could see people coming back the next week and say, oh, shoot, I forgot my voucher. So the person has to retain their receipt. They're getting a receipt from our cash register. We at Town Hall are also going to keep a logbook that on July 6th, I sold a, a sticker. I, okay. I okay. received payment from Bob Carlson and his address. Okay. And then we're going to keep an Excel spreadsheet that has that information. Perfect. Which we're so, going to have to do the same thing on a Saturday. Right. When you guys are working, you're going to keep it on a, a clipboard. Okay. So like and if then you're selling the voucher, we'll I'm going to log it into the box. Okay. So yes, you, you I expect you to lose it. Yeah. But once they've gotten their first sticker on their car, they don't need to retain the receipt anymore because already entered into the book is that vehicle one with the license plate has gotten a sticker. So vehicle two, they can automatically get it. So Gary can come up seven times with yep. seven different vehicles and get seven stickers because he's in the logbook once he paid for the first one. But they need to show proof of residency at that address. So I had someone come into town hall earlier this week asking questions, saying that their children take their trash for them. Uh, this was an older person, older resident saying their children take their trash for them to the transfer station. They don't live in town. And I said, no, they are not entitled to a sticker. They cannot get one. It has to be registered to your address. Yeah. So they can take her car to mm -hmm. the dump. Right. Okay. And they're going right. to have to take the vehicle to the dump or transition to get the sticker put on because we're not handing anybody yeah. a loose sticker. So I did think that when we first talked about it, that it was going to be at town hall uh, and, and I, I completely understand the convenience of it being at the transfer station. Um, 
it will be a little bit more challenging, challenging just with people coming and going and the, the whole process. I kind of envisioned us right in the parking lot of the of the town hall, the old town hall, and selling them there. But um, well, the thing is, don't we, we're not turning anyone away in the month of July. Yeah. So if you come in, you don't have one. You show proof of residency. They say, okay, between now and the next time you come, yeah, go to town hall and get yourself a sticker. And how about people that are out of um, town for the summer? I have had a couple of people come up to me. In fact, I think that she actually called town hall and said, um, you know, we we go to our yeah, we're selling stickers place. all year though. So once we get, the, say, we do okay. the first month at town hall, the first three months at town, that's when the rush is going to be. Yeah. So you, we'll, we'll still be selling them in September, October. We okay, won't be perfect because we're going to transfer the whole thing to the transfer station at that point. Yeah. Because once we're through the first, say, if there's 1,200 cars getting stickers, the first 800 are going to happen in the first three months. Okay. Yeah. We, right. I, I envision just July and August at Town Hall and transitioning it after Labor Day, but we'll look at how the numbers are and we'll make sure we put signs up at the transfer station telling people with adequate notice when it's transitioned. Don't forget, some people, some might move into town six months after we start. So the reason moving it there or moving it there eventually. So you think there's just the cash flow in the beginning? Yes. Is that your concern? Yep. The, the volume of people coming in, the amount of cash going in, coming in, going out, um, the the change that may be necessary. Um, we're hoping everyone will come with two crisp twenty dollar bills or a check made payable mm -hmm. to the town of North Stonington. Um, but we'll have to have change, and I just with the operations there and everything else that's going on, I think it's more secure to have it at town hall. And then, and they'll be, and they'll also be taking the money for the the bulky waste, so they'll have increased traffic from that as well. So, two questions for you: um, Will they have? Will this just be handwritten? Will they have a computer system up? I know they used to have a computer up there. Do they still have one? And will this be where they'll be able to look up down the road after we these initials? Will they be able to just look it up? Um, like, well, look up what? So if, if someone's paid, no, that's not going to be a digital file. We're going to have a spreadsheet, but that was just for auditing purposes in our office. So they're going to receive. They're going to have a book. They're, yeah, they're going to have a book of all the names and addresses of town with spaces to enter in the stickers and the license plates. I'm just saying, like so they if, have right now. If they if they come and got one sticker, and now they're coming back for their additional vehicles. Because it's already in the book with the first vehicle's license plate and the sticker number, they are entitled to X number of stickers for their anybody else. At so their they're going to look it up by their sticker number because it's, they're coming in different orders, right? If they're coming to, so say Brian got his sticker and his wife is coming to get the second sticker, they're going to look up the address and it's going to say that they've already gotten one sticker. So any other cars at that address can automatically get a sticker with no receipt because it's already in but the book. But they're looking at the address on a it's a spreadsheet that is they, they already have a book up there that they've been using for years to enter the stickers. So they have a system that works for them. So they enter in at the next to the address the license plate and the sticker number that that person has gotten for that okay. address. So it's like it was like, when we did the COVID test, we had those sheets. And it's all done by road. What road do you live on? What's your number? And yeah. so Northwest Corner. Well, road. that's what I'm asking. If it's yeah. if it's easy for them to be able to look quickly compared yes. to it's going to take them. So I no, just it's, wanna, it's a binder by address. Okay. I just want to clarify. Um, if I if my husband goes and gets um, a sticker for his truck that is clearly registered to 44 Pinecrest, we have one other registered vehicle at 44 Pinecrest, and that is mine. I can't go up and ask for my seventh and eighth sticker if oh. there are not seven right. or eight cars only you have to show to proof of residency for that car it has to be either you technically speaking it should be registered to that address we know that there are certain circumstances where that's not the case and we'll deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis so a lot of lease via like company cars things like that um and then what about businesses in town that drive their personal vehicle so, um... so say like somebody that owns I mean, say Presta, for instance. I mean, we have garbage service there, but in the past, they were able to bring stuff to the dump because they're a business but owner. They're not a, but they're not a resident? But they're not a resident. We haven't really addressed that. But is that a, um, do they have pickup though? Do they, do they go to the transfer station or do they have trash pickup? I mean, we have, but there are instances. So for instance, like 
with my store, when it, I had the Hummer, I was able, I got a sticker for the Hummer. But you it's it's on trash. It, it, I know, but it was it was based on the business, not the so you're saying, taxes on that. So program. you're saying town trash. So if they can show proof they have a business in town. Yeah, I mean, they're paying taxes. You know, so here's the thing. We don't want to be idiots, right? We don't want to. Anything we get is going to be more than we get now, which is zero. So that's why I don't want to have any fights with bulky waste. If it, if if Charles said, I mean, not it's Charles, yeah, Charles. If Charles says that's a medium load, and Brian says, Charles, that's a small load. You know, Brian, I think it's a medium, but you know what? It's a small. I'm because I'd rather take the twenty-five dollars on a small than a zero. Now we're not going to argue between a small and an extra large, but if it's on the borderline, I said then we're not going to argue. Go with the customer. The customer's right. If he says it's small, it's small. So say that that business is paying for trash hauling from one of our local haulers. When that's going to the incinerator, it's getting charged to North Stonington. And then we're billing back to the hauler. So it's town trash. It all comes through the town. So it should be considered the same. And if you work out of town, like I did, and I had a Coventry lumber truck for years, and had Rhode Island plates, but I live in town. Nick wouldn't give me a sticker. I'm not because he said it's not that truck's not registered in town. My argument is, yeah, but all the trash I generate is, tra is generated at my house. Maybe the occasional McDonald's bag or Dunkin' Donuts bag, but most of it's from my house, and I pay taxes. That that was a hard rule because I had a company car when I first. So we will be giving it. if you have a company car that's out of state, but you live in our town, you're generating your trash in our town. So, but I think we need to be clear that. If I own a construction company, well, that comes on the bulk. Right, but I just want to 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 make it clear for people listening that just because I have a business in town and I have a truck in town doesn't mean I can bring everything back here from somewhere else. Well, the other thing is, that, so on bulky waste, there's going to be times we're going to ask for a building permit. Now, not on everything because if you've got a tree for it, you got a dog house or something right. you broke up, you can tell it's not from a house. But if you have sheetrock and roof shingles and things like that, they're going to say, "I need to see a building." And, building a, a permit because we want to know where it's coming from. I don't want trucks full of stuff from Westerly and Preston showing up at our transfer station because we're, well, up until now, we're free. And that all maybe we'll still be, we're using the same rates as Preston. We haven't voted on that yet. Like, we didn't start those. We haven't started them, but. But we didn't vote on them. I thought we did. We publicized them. We, publicized we never them. voted on them. I don't believe we were going to have that discussion later. I, it's going out with the tax bill. I, I don't know what to tell you. All I know is we said, we, I know we've discussed it's going to be the same as Preston. So do we have to vote on it? Is that something that's votable? I, I would, if we're voting on the sticker fee and we're voting on, yeah, because it's not, it's a, something we're implementing. So do you want to vote and say, do you want to vote tonight and say we're going to have vote and have it the same as Preston? I mean, do you have a reason why you don't want it to be? No, but I'm just saying, we said we were going to have that discussion about bulky waste a little late at some point in the future. And yeah. these were what was, projected but we were going to have more discussion we projected it. it for the budget but we didn't right we didn't vote on it and i guess we haven't really publicized the number exact numbers anywhere have we well then what do you mean it's in the tax it. bill <laughs> what and what are they what do they say as she, as christine's looking that up i am glad that you brought up about the dog houses or a shed roof because that was a, a concern for people that expressed it online when they saw the the, the new rule at the transfer station. So mm -hmm. I think it is important for people to understand that there are exceptions to the building mm -hmm. permit rule. Um, so small is 25, medium is 35, large is 75, and extra large is 125. I'll vote on that now, I agree, since it's gonna go out with the tax bill. Is there any reason why? It's that's the same as Preston, correct? So it's based on the, Truck or the load? The load. The load. So if I, your truck's much bigger than me. If you have like a smaller load in your truck and my truck is heaped up, I have more material than you. So I shouldn't right. be the same as you. Right. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that we don't have a, you know, an eight foot bed that's only so, got a little stuff in it. And that we're saying, well, that's a large truck. So here's the thing. We're still working on getting the scales installed and, and getting pricing on that. That'll end all that. Because the scales are the scales, except you got to come and get weighed. Then you got to drive around and get weighed again when you're empty. So and then you get charged the difference. But it's going to take more manpower, more dollars, and and the cement work to get the scales put in, and the scale the scales work. We know that because we had right. whether it's cost effective is a whole other. And if 
Preston and Mont Montville are using this small, medium, large, extra large system, and it's not causing an issue. In the beginning, it was just working out the bugs, but it's not kind of causing an issue now. If we're having an issue, and we have the scales that we own, then we should go to the town and say we, we need to install the scales. But if there's not an issue, we can just go with the small, medium, large, extra larges if it works. Yeah. So and they're I, and they're on the website already. We just never. As long as um, Charles is going to be uh, as long as he is comfortable with what we are considering a small medium large and extra large and he's got that in his mind and he can he can articulate that to somebody who might ask especially at the beginning I'm um, I'm good I will make a motion um to um can we can I just move it forward mm -hmm. can I make a motion to have um, the bulky waste fees be $25 for a small load, um, $35 for a medium load, $50, $75 for a large load, and $125 for an extra large load. That's my motion. I'll second. Okay. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. And we did put out in the thing that the Saturday sales were going to be a town hall. So that's Originally. Wrong. No, no, this this is what's going out in the tax. I know, but we can't change but it. That's fine. But they won't get those tax bills until after. And we and I the quarterly is going out on July 1st. And in the article, it says that it's at town. I mean, it's at the transfer station. And then we just answer questions. When there's you know, and if people call and say, you know what, we it didn't after the first week, let's say it doesn't work. And people go, I thought you were going to be transit. Well, it didn't work. So now it's a town hall. Or, We'll have to make some adjustments. It's not going to be perfect. It's the first time we've ever done it. This is going out only in the um, real estate tax bills. So when you get your real estate bill, this should be. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about this discussion? Okay, Brian. Go ahead, you sit close. Stand this right. I have to pay the money to get two vouchers, right? Or do I get as many as I want? You get one voucher, you get as many stickers as you need for cars that are registered to you that are at your house. So if I pay the money, then. Um, you get a sticker, Pam gets a sticker, her sister gets a and sticker. I got to bring the. Right. No, you got to bring her a car, oh, to, car to put the sticker on at the transfer station. We're not oh, handing someone like. Where I get the vouchers at? If you want to get it at town hall Monday through Friday, starting July fifth, or getting at the transfer station on July eighth, and then the next two Saturdays probably the transfer station. But we'll, we'll... can't get them now. No, because we're in the we're in this fiscal year. We have to wait till next fiscal year. Okay. And the only reason we're not doing it on the first because so, second Sunday, the town voted to take a floating holiday on the third because the fourth of July is on a Tuesday. So basically, town hall is closed Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So we'll start on the fifth, but but the bulky waste will start on the first because there's no stickers involved for, on that. So. Right, and the bulky waste is just for like I do a lot of my own stuff. So if I bring in sheetrock, I gotta have a table for that. Well, now, if if it's one or two sheets, but if you look like you're bringing in stuff because you're cleaning up a job site, there's a good chance they're going to say, "You can you see that we can we see a building permit?" Because I got one room that I redo in my house. And don't forget, this is as much to protect you as charge you because we don't want somebody from another town bringing in all this right. stuff. No, I understand. Because why should we charge you but not him? You know, why should? I mean, I don't know if I need a building permit just to redo one room in my house. And that would go to a bulk of waste. Right. But you but your address is there. You say you're working on your house and okay. we're not we're not looking to be we'll see what happens. we're not trying to aggravate people, right? No, no, I know. I just want to be clear on it. I don't want to load my truck up and go up there and they say, Hey, where's your building permit? I don't have no building permit. I'm just doing a room. Mm -hmm. But the brush and stuff, that's that's not considered. No, that's still we still brought, yeah, we still that. And I think we'll have a, like we do, and I think we'll have a dumpster up front for when you have like two or three or four pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. You're not going to charge you a, a small load for four pieces of wood. You know, we throw in the dumpster up in the front so you don't have to drive around the back and unload your truck. We'll still do that. 
You know, I can't see charging someone twenty five dollars for throwing away three pieces of wood. Yeah, or chairs. Depends. You got springs in it. It's a. It's another whole ball game. I tear my stuff down if they bust that glue. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. Do you have an online hand from Sean? From who? Sean. Sean, what's up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have another meeting before this bulky waste issue uh, takes effect? We have a meeting on the twenty seventh. Because I I noticed this isn't on your agenda tonight, tonight, but you're voting on it. But it is on our agenda. Is it? Well, tra or transfer station sticker sales, right? I guess. Right. I guess you're right. The blocky waste, and and just that some public might want to hear this discussion or contribute to this discussion, if you know they knew it was happening tonight. No, you're right, and I have. And I apologize. And actually, it wasn't something I was going to, we were going to vote on, but Brett brought up and mentioned we hadn't voted on in the past. So we can add it to the agenda on the 27th and take a revote. It, it, I mean, I think you have a motion on the floor that I, I would recommend tabling it. Uh, and and also, uh, oh, what was I thinking? Uh, is there going to be a policy and procedures uh, developed on this before it's instituted i mean it's to so there's a clear understanding of what employees are supposed to do uh what public might expect and so forth um excuse me we haven't really worked on i mean we've talked about policies and procedures right along since we started this discussion i guess we haven't put it in writing other than the articles i wrote for the for the quarterly. So uh, yeah. it, may, it would make sense since we just did policies and procedures for accounting pra practices. It, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're not doing an ordinance, but you're, you're, it, it really is something that could be an ordinance, <laughs> but uh, the detail, the people should be aware of what the expectations are, both as a customer and as an employee. So I think and we, I think we can start with what we discussed at this point and see how it rolls out and then put together a policies and procedures for future administration. So we're all working out the same in the same way. But of course, at any time, there's another board of selectmen. They can change. They can change the rules. Right. They it is in the. Policy. Right. Well, I mean, it, it's just that. It seems like it's some idea. It's a bunch of ideas now, and not nothing's really, really concrete as far as expectations. So about out of out of such as out of state or out of uh, town, you know, bulky waste coming in. Uh, it seems like there should be some clear rules as to what you know what contractors are required to show in order to leave debris and forth and and, and just the different aspects of it it's it's so talked about in different meetings and at different times but yet there's nothing all in one place so I'll, i can work on policies and procedures for transfer station use with the town foreman and assistant foreman, and then bring that to the board of selectmen for a final vote. But I don't think we need to have that to roll it out. Um, I, so. I, I I like that idea, and I agree, Sean. That's a great point. I would like to live with the process for a couple of months before we finally decide on where the entire standard operating procedure lands. So so that we're not revising something. Because right, sometimes your things time. sound like they work on paper and then in actuality yeah, they don't. So absolutely. but I think it's right, a great right. idea. Um, again, just like we just did with the accounting policies and procedures that the auditors had us do. So and we were living it and then we had to write down how it was working. So uh, Nicole's point is I wouldn't mind waiting 60 days, seeing how it's worked, come up with a policy and procedures for the transfer station use, and then have it the Board of Selectmen vote on it to adopt it. 
How's that? Okay, just, just it's just some thoughts. I, you know, eventually, you know, they'll be more concrete, I guess, as as you uh, with the pros and the cons of of the program. Yeah, I I agree, and I, anytime we can write something down and have it, so for the next group that's looking at it, um, it, it makes sense, gives them a good starting point, and then they can always vote to change it if they want to. So yeah, All right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye. Um, one thing before we move from transfer station sales, can we amend this to um, that the fee is for all vehicles within that household? So I so if you go back, originally we said only two vehicles. So our motion was for transportation would be charged for one year, uh, $40 to start in July. The idea is to have two stickers per household. We talked that about that, but we didn't vote on that. We did. And we voted on two. I thought we changed it and voted. No, we I, voted think you, on... I thought you argued the point to make it all, not two. No. Yeah. I think that might have come up after we did two. I think, I think the argument was from one to two. I think we had, we, you and I in the office had extensive conversation with people dropping in and having discussions. And so when we met with the transfer station staff and the foreman and the assistant foreman, that was when we said definitively we were going to as many cars as you can prove are registered with that. So yes, Brett's right. We need to amend. So we have to do that with a vote then. I'll make a, a motion to... Forty dollars to start in July for all vehicles within the household, registered to the household. I'll second. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Good catch. I really thought we voted on it was all, but like you said, we had so many discussions. Sometimes I forget if I'm having them in my office or having them here or having them on a little man's diner in the morning. It's everywhere. I don't want lots to talk about town, which is great. Um, are we done with this category? Okay. Accounting policies and procedures. So I'm sure you all had a chance to, in the last three days, to read this multi-page manual. Um, I will say that I read it front to back, made changes and suggestions. Christine read it front to back. Susan made, Susan's the one that created this. She did a wonderful job. Um, then I went back to ensure that all my recommendations were, um, either changed or we discussed why it couldn't change. And all we're looking for right now is we want to adopt this at our next meeting, not tonight. Oh, Don't get nervous. <laughs> so we want to adopt it at our next meeting because the auditors, we'd like to be able to give it to the auditors a copy when they come in for early auditing. But if there's any changes that want to be made, we need to talk about those tonight. Yes. Yeah, so what, what we'd like okay. to do is go through, have any changes so that I can make the updates and give you a clean copy before the meeting on the 27th so that we can adopt it. This was one of the things identified by the auditors in our prior year audit that we needed to have a written, they understood we have policies and procedures, but we didn't have them all centralized in one place. So they um, asked that both the town side and the board of ed side create their own policy and procedure manual so that we have it for um, moving forward. So the one change I will tell you that I've already made on page two in the table of contents is um, general and general ledger is misspelled. So I've already fixed that. Oh, I didn't check this for spelling. Mistakes. I, I don't think there should be any <laughs> other spelling mistakes, but if, if things nope, are in all is. caps, nope. then that can we want to just do. Uh, so on page eight, you did read it. in um, the capital non-recurring fund, three quarters at the bottom of the page. Yes. Almost the last sentence, the second to the last sentence says any unexpected, any, any unexpended portion of such proportion appropriation. It's, 10, it's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> so sorry. Um, remaining after completion shall evert to the undesignated fund. I'm assuming that revert. that's not some kind of financial <laughs> term I don't know about. Good so catch. revert. That was the only spelling thing that I had seen. Wow. I told Christine, uh, this was my, this has been my reading material at bedtime every single night for the last week. And it has taken, it has put me to bed every single night. Isn't it enlightening though? 
Uh, no, it's actually really good. I, I mean, uh, I read it. I learned a lot by reading it. And then after reading it, I understand exactly where Sean's coming from with the policies and procedures at yeah. the transfer station. Yep. So. Since, since we're on that top, that line right there, I just have a question. So it says the Board of Education's non lapsing fund is also part of the CNR fund. Yes. Don't we keep that in a separate account? Nope. It's in the CNR bank account. So we just track that separately. Yes. So it's not okay. Yep. Within QuickBooks, it has its own separate category, but for banking purposes, it's in CNR. Okay. How, how do we want to, um, how do we want to do page that? by page? What page you want? All right. Well, uh, should we just like, start at the beginning? Yeah. Um, do you know the answer? Just shut it up. Do you have anything uh, that my first question is on page eight? Does anybody have anything else not prior really. to page eight? No. Um, so just the uh, page eight, the capital projects fund. Um, I just know that in past uh, meetings, we've had conversations. I seem to remember conversations of people saying that capital projects or capital money should not be used for repair of buildings. And clearly in here, it says that we can. So it's really just a comment. Yeah. So um, different people have different definitions of capital. This is the municipal government version of capital. So if they work in the private sector, it may be a little bit different than what we're doing. So this this is an accurate definition. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I just knew I, that was good for me to be able to see that in writing. So was this done all on its own, or was we kind of tweaked it for our town based on the auditor or, or somebody give us this? So uh, this is taken from multiple towns sample documents. Okay. Some things within it are um, board of finance of established policies. Right. Um, some things are as policies you guys have voted on at different times, like our purchasing policies in here um, and just different things that we've, we've done through the years. And so, some of the actual practice. That yeah. we've it, it's all actual practice. It's all how we do things. Um, the one thing I will say is uh, we put in here what we hope the capital plan should be moving forward. Um, so we can tweak that next year as we further develop that. Um, I'd like to, for your first meeting in July, I'd like to have the, the five-year capital plan on the agenda and give you the forms that were used last year and talk about the process we did for receiving that information last year so that we can get the ball. Yes. The so all of the conversation with Board of Finance and us about the lack of a capital plan, this clearly lays out that is a there's a timeline that I think you send out asking every, and if we don't get that, <laughs> we don't get that back from people and that the, the fire department and the highway department and any other department does not give us their five-year plan grading what is most important and most critical for them. At work, we have to do that. We have to rate because we know we're not getting everything. I don't wanna make a decision about what the fire department gets or doesn't get. I need them to tell us, here you have $150,000. Here's what you can do with it kind of a thing. So uh, it was good for me to see in here that clearly there's an entire process for a five-year capital plan. So I actually had a question on, page. on that. What page? With page 12. Um, so we can amend this at some point going forward because yes. I would like to, so when I look up capital plans from other towns, there are a lot that by October or so they approve their capital plan and that's what their capital plan is. Some even take it to a town vote of over their, their capital plan budget. Um, so I know that says that in fall, but we don't talk anywhere about like the approval of that plan. Yep. This is, this is just where we're at right now. Okay. So once we uh, adopt that plan, we'll update the manual. And this is meant to be more of a living, breathing document that as things change, we'll update what's going on. Okay. And that satisfies the auditor's request to have a document mm -hmm. like this. Can I just quickly go back to page 11? Um, uh, under budget management, um, uh, about halfway down, the Board of Ed is required to monitor their spending to ensure adherence with the approved budget providing monthly status report to the Board of Finance. My question was, is that happening now? Are we caught up? 
Um, it is not happening. We are still getting into a flow. So I recently received for the Board of Finance, I think it was February, March, and April financials that I passed along to them. This is just what the Board of Finance gets, not, not the reconciliation money. So the reconciliation is where we're behind. Okay, because we are, we are, we, I think that we need to, yeah, I'm, this I'm interested in knowing more about what the barriers are, um, because we're violating our, yeah, this policy. is, this is the policy that the Board of Finance approved, so this yes. is, this is what's supposed to be happening. Yeah. Um, the Board of Ed Chair knows where we're at with getting reports. Yeah, so. I mean, because the school year is essentially and by the way, the Over. board of um, their business manager is working on one of these for the for their side of the street also. A policy. They have to come up with policy procedures for their their yeah. own book like this. And it has yeah. to be done in time for the audit. Yeah. And what's that date? Our pre audit is July sixth and seventh. Oh. Our actual audit is September sixth and seventh. So this has to be done by September, or they'd like it for July. We really should have this by June thirtieth. We've had a whole year, so. Okay. So are we going to? Um, are, we're, we're, I'm sure it'll be a mention in our audit that we don't have the financial statements that we need a monthly status report. The, the auditors are less concerned. They want, they need this book so that they know how we're doing things, but they're not going into the, this isn't a checklist for them of this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Still a concern that we are not abiding by the policy, but I know we're working on that. All right. Are they using this as reference? Yeah, it's always nice when some of the policies. They haven't asked us for it at this point, right? No, I mean, I'll I'll send it. I'll, I'll send Bill ours, so he has it. But he got samples as well from the the auditors actually gave us some samples to follow, and then Susan did her own research as well. Because they just, especially if this is in our new policy, that they should be aware of this part. Does this Actually, have to be that's the Board of Finance policy that was approved a couple years ago. Right. So it's really these aren't new policies. This is just putting it on paper what it's our policy is. Putting them all are. together. Yeah. Okay. Right. Does this have to, does this entire packet have to be reviewed and approved every year? Or no? So uh, the accounting generalist and myself will continually go through this and update it. If there are changes made, yes, I, it will be brought to the Board of Selectmen for approval. Okay. Uh, hey. Page 13. Yeah. I didn't get a chance. I meant to look it up, but oh wait, wait. The the undesignated fund policy. Wasn't there um the remedy if we are over a certain amount, what the what can be done? This was copied directly from their policy. I could have sworn when it was worked on it was okay, if they're over the 17%, then it's used to lower the mill rate or there's was specific things, maybe. That was in the draft and never made it to the. I, I can look back and just double check. Just because if that is in there, I'd like it mm -hmm. in here. Because I think the residents, if they ever say, hey, what is all this? And they look through it, they should so, know. So if is, we there a, um, is there a policy if it's over 17%, but also one if they're under 8.5? I believe there was. Well, well, at least it was part of the discussion. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll check it tomorrow. Um, just a really silly um, thing on page 17 about the mail. Um, that's why I asked if it was, um, we might just want to put that um, the director of admin and finance opens the mail for the selectman's office with exception to the first selectman's mail who opens his or her. Yep. Thank you for her. Thank you for. So just for that, there is a second page of that okay. policy. Perfect. We will add that in. Now you're going to mess up my table of contents. I, oh, shoot. You might be able to make it smaller print and fit it down below. Yeah, and it does, Bob, it does talk about if it's a shortfall or if it's an overage. And the annual review. Yep. 
Did our treasurer look through this? No. Is it something we should ask him to look through? Because it kind of affects him. We can. Then I'm on page 20. I have just a question on 25. Does anybody um, have anything before then? I have one on 22. Okay. Um, so the policy approval of grants, uh, where it talks about like the application. Um, do we need to put in here how they're prioritized? Or so, for instance, we know we had that, that steep. We didn't know about it till closer to the deadline. So do we need to have anything that talks about that? Or is that just a would be a separate discussion? I think that would just be a separate discussion because I think it's it's more it's not a, a general necessary policy or procedure, I think, and we're learning by as we go. Okay. So Nicole, 25. 25, just a question for me, um, all the way down on 3D, contracts will be awarded to the lowest qualified bidder. I just want to make sure that I understand that it's not lowest bidder, like we chose Best Tech, who was not, no, they were, Best Tech they were. was, never mind, um, bad example. So but, if somebody, so say when we did the windows at, at Hewitt Farmhouse, yeah. if we had a quote and Somebody bid 42 windows, there's not 42, somebody bid 20 windows and somebody else bid 22 windows and there's really 22 windows. They're lower because they bid 20, but that's not the actual project. So. One of our bidders were lower because they forgot windows. Yeah, but what if, so what I'm asking is if, what if we know the quality of work with this, this bidder who is $20,000 and lower, but the quality of this work is better and a little bit higher. Does it still give us the ability to yes. award it to the most qualified lowest bid? You, as the selectman, you can always, like, even if they weren't the lowest bidder, and technically they're not the lowest qualified bidder because the other person spec'd it out appropriately, you as the board of selectmen can still vote to go with that because okay. you have the ability to override your own policy. Yeah, okay. And it's lowest bitter and highest qualified like it's a good yeah the that's why i wanted to make at. sure i understood lowest qualified bidder mm -hmm. okay yeah if we just said lowest bidder then we don't have any real work we still the same meeting <laughs> Oh, 33. Bingo. Credit card procedure. Um, this was an eye opener for me. Um, so, because I don't see, um, oh, and I hope to God I'm right in saying this, when I'm signing checks, I'm not seeing Correct. checks paying out somebody's credit card. So I wanted to, um, all credit card use must be approved through the selectman's office with exception to, First Selectman Public Works Recreation and Senior Center. So I, I guess they still have to be accountable to what they're purchasing and what they're putting on the credit card, correct? Yes. So so what happens is if anyone else, if anyone that doesn't have a credit card needs to use a credit card, we have a form that they filled up, fill out, they send it over to me, and then I give them my credit card and say, buy whatever it is that you're buying and give me the receipt. If any of the people that have credit cards are buying things. They use their own credit card and they're responsible for putting together their, their purchases at the end of the month on the statement, identifying what line item that's being attributed Perfect. to. Um, and that's reviewed by and you. And that's reviewed before it gets paid. Okay. Uh, it comes into play a lot with like the town garage because they're not at town hall. They're out yep. doing what they have to yep. do. And they have to be able to but purchase something. I, and they have I town credit. Sure. Yes, right. these are these are all town credit cards that are paid um, through one central account. Mm -hmm. Are there more debit cards than credit cards? We don't we don't, we don't sign have any checks for credit cards. We no, they're have. actually processed differently. Yeah, we we pay it through. Um, I log into the credit card website, 
I do pay your home credit card and I pay it through the bank account that way. So, so if we were interested in seeing a log of what is being charged on those credit cards, sure. we could if we yeah. wanted to. Sure. All right. We could. I wish you would pull mine. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this blank? I was going to say most random charge cash bag. Yeah, and maybe we should see that like once a quarter or something. You, uh, you could. That way we, because if we look at our checks when we sign them and we look at what budget line they come out of, but yeah. there's a whole another list of expenditures being paid for that we don't ever see. Um, really quickly, page 34, um, the last paragraph, it just speaks to the fact that um, the director of admin and finance reviews all charges, ensures they are attributed to the correct line items, collects and supports, all, you know, all supporting receipts except for public works. I'm so they put wondering. their own packet together. So basically the way things work right now, um, if the senior center director spends money, she comes and gives me her receipt to hold on to so that nothing happens to it. And then when the credit card statement comes in, I put her stuff together. Okay. Okay. So versus public works is who puts his own, own together. together. Yeah. Gotcha. Not that they're exempt from that process. No, it's just I'm not the one compiling their, gotcha. their receipt. So they still do it and give it to you. Yeah. Okay. And then everything's reviewed. Susan puts everything into QuickBooks. She gives it to me, and then I pay, pay it online. Okay. okay, on page 35, under surety bonds, it actually speaks to um, the, um, the hauler mm -hmm. situation. We'll just amend that when and if, not when, not if when we go to our own owning our own process this is, this is separate this so this is um cwpm and the people the, the private haulers in town that go to people's houses and pick up the trash gotcha thank you so it's cwpm and um perkins i think those were all my questions i'm good with Brett, do you have any other things out? Oh, I actually I just, so the page. Please. So page 36, that the first selectman and director of administration and finance initiate all town approved position. Okay. I answered my own question when I read out loud. It was just, it's an approved position. So you guys don't just say, hey, we're hiring this. All right. <laughs> no, but I but, know Bob likes to go crazy and wants to make town hall huge. No, I'm but that was but, a joke. But basically, it's it's like if we're if we know there's going to be, if it's just filling a, an existing position and we don't need to change anything, like if we had a, a truck driver leave in the highway, we would just do what we need to fill. But we know that if there's any changes that are happening to any other principal positions, we're going to come talk here before we post any. So it's just talking about general filling of vacancies. I wrestle with that just a little bit. I think anytime there's a vacancy, we should discuss it and look to make sure that's the, well, I guess with union, it makes the union makes it a little more challenging, yes. but it's like other companies, like once something leaves, you look at that position, okay, do we still need that or can we modify it or? I'm, I'm gonna tell you, honestly, the only time we will not come to you is if it's a highway vacancy anything else we're gonna see if it's the best move for the town to keep it the way it is or okay but again if we need a different truck driver we need a different truck driver so. but all of our truck drivers are wonderful um one last question for me on page 43 the five-year capital improvement plan again yes um don't have to answer it here but i'd like to know which departments routinely yearly submit their five-year capital improvement plan? So we always get from highway, from the fire company, from the ambulance. There's an established plan for the John Dean Gallup house. So we get from Hewitt Farms. Um, we hear from someone as to how much money should be put in the land acquisition fund. Typically it's conservation. Um, and those are really the ones that we consistently get. Okay. If there's something coming up, there's, you know, there's the discussion from the assessor's office. If there's money that needs to go into the reval capital non-reoccurring account, um, depending on who the planner 
has been. There's discussion of um, timing with TOCD and putting funds for that, um, flyover, if there's anything that, that they know is coming up. Everyone that gets an email for a budget gets an email for a capital. So, oh, and we always get from um, tech, technology because we have replacement plans for computers. And as the plan develops, when we come up with the plan, we should tweak that and say, okay, we, we need requests from these or we might not need them from those. But because if you look at a lot of the other towns, when they have a capital plan, they're working with planning and zoning to see, okay, what the future looks, what are those needs based on development? that we might need that we might not know, but they I don't think they've been very involved in the capital plan in the, the past because it we never laid it out that way. Any other changes? So this sparked my question, but on page 37, where we talk about payroll, is there a benefit or should we look into um, any cost savings by going to a two week? pay period like probably 95 percent of the other we were on it a weekly we we're, we're on, on weekly. weekly wow um i don't see any cost savings to it um is there anything with the unions no, no we we have managers rights to change that because do we have at least 90 percent on um uh direct deposit everyone if not all everyone has to well, just when no i look at it print, there's no check printing the payroll oh. companies were cheaper if you were bi-weekly compared to weekly in the processing and the time it takes to do it. So. It was something that I discussed when I started because I came from somewhere that did it every two weeks and there just hasn't been a, a need. But well, okay. We can do it by next at some point. Maybe. We could look at it. Be, but it's... It, It'll just take twice as long every other week. That's the thing. So, all right. Any I'm other things? Still, Brett, you're still, there's people still online. Brian, do go home. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> uh, so, do we have to make a motion to? Nope. No. No. Nope. All right. So, that. I'm going to make these I'm changes. Not. You'll have fresh copies. The, weekend before the meeting in your mailbox. Um, Sean, I will print you a copy tomorrow so that you can take a look. Um, and yeah, Brett, unless you have anything else because you're still thumbing through pages. No, no, no. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any of my little highlights. I think I'm good. So what schools have to? Who would like to do those? All right, I will uh, make a motion to approve tax refunds totaling $1,152.90 to Thomas Layton, CoreLogic, Michael Ergo, Eunice Supton, Eunice Schwab, and Krista Portras, and Robert Petrucci. I'll second. Okay. Oh, you to, in the tune, to the tune of you want to give the did you put you said there? that for us yeah. sorry i think i was sleeping right. so <laughs> there's a motion on photo a second so the motion and a second to approve all the tax refunds totaling one thousand one hundred and fifty two dollars and ninety cents all of those say aye 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 okay next we have an old business demolition of one story 298 i'll make this really quick so i emailed them Eric, who was the project manager yesterday, and said, I, I'm waiting for the cap to be put on my new wall. It's not capped yet. And I haven't got a final bill. The email I said they'll be there on Wednesday and Thursday putting the cap on. It just came in. So the, the, the job will be finished as of Thursday. He said, as far as the final bill, that's up to Jim. Jim Newberry is the owner. So he said, I'll drop him an email, let him know. Because I said, I can't close out the project. So the project's done, and I know what, I, what the final bill is. So hopefully I'll have, by the next meeting, the project will be done and closed out. Uh, and maybe the grass will be grown, but it's only if we get some more rain. Yeah. That's where we are on that. Um, and, and there shouldn't be major changes because there was no change order. I haven't seen any change orders at all since the very first the final bill is the final bill. I'm hoping. Let's see. Legally, it is. 
Um, next, vacancies and appointments. We had one uh, request by Mott Grigg, who's the chairman of Inland Wetlands. Dear Mr. Carlson, on behalf of Inland Wetlands and Water Course Commission, I am asking the Board of Selectmen to reappoint the following members for a five year term Mark Grigg, Cody Bill, Marvin Chase Jr., Eric Offen, and Adam Bernat for section 9.2 of the North Stonington Town Ordinance at your next scheduled meeting. So I will make a motion that we approve the reappointment of those as read in this request by Mark Grigg. I'll second. Okay. So do we have a, any kind of attendance records or do we know that these all these people have been coming to, to meetings? So we don't, but the chairman is the one that made the request. I assume if he was unhappy with the board, but I, I'm not gonna mention the board, we talked about this today. Um, there's another board in town that has, that's an appointed board and one of their members never comes and they ask, I said, well, the person just hasn't resigned. I've asked twice. But what we can do is they're going to be reappointed. The entire board's being reappointed in November. I said, when you ask, do, I showed them this letter. I said, give me the same letter with the people you want to reappoint and just leave that person off. We won't, if they won't resign, we just won't reappoint them. So that. Well, we, you can actually, from an appointed board, you can remove someone. They're not elected. They're appointed. They're appointed. So you can remove somebody if they're not showing up to me. You don't have to wait till reappointment. We don't have to, but okay. It's just that um, they were pretty active on the board in the last couple of years. They haven't been as active. And I guess we could, but and between now and November, it's not like there's anybody knocking on the door to become part of this board. But um, anyway, okay. if you decide that you want to go that route, just let me know. We can do that. But as far as this goes, um, we have a motion in a second. So all those in favor of reappointing this board for the Inland Wetlands and Water Course Commission say aye. 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 Okay. ARPA funds. Um, Christine, you want to talk about ARPA funds? I would love to talk about ARPA funds. So um, we have three things to discuss with ARPA. First thing is that we were notified by the uh, State of Connecticut Department of Aging and Disability Services that there's been uh, ARPA funds identified for senior centers within the State of Connecticut. Um, so we have $15,680 that specifically have to be used for the senior center for projects that are somewhat related to COVID that fall under the categories of provision of government services. And those are facility improvements or programming. And there's a very long questionnaire that we're going to need to fill out about how this qualifies and why it's COVID related. Um, after discussions with Teresa, the senior center director, we and some prior conversations that Bob and I have had, um, one of the things that we think we could use these funds for is to upgrade the HVAC at the senior center and transition from the um, old air conditioning system that breaks frequently and the current electric heat that we have that costs far too much money to um, a ductless mini split system in the building. So we did get a quote for that. It is for more than the funds that we have. Um, but we also had a meeting with Eversource this week that if we work with certain installers and get certain products, we can get um, rebates back on the system. So um, the, for a heat, the heat pump program is uh, $2,000 back per ton of the system. And I think the system is, I can't figure out and I need to confirm if this is a two to three ton system or a two, three ton system. So it could be either 4,000 or $6,000 back on the system itself, um, and then $250 off the purchase if we use a distributor on the list. Um, so. What was the cost on that purchase? Yeah, how much was the overage? So the total cost on this, which does not include the um, electrical, is about $26,000. It's just one quote that we have. We're gonna get, obviously we're gonna get multiple quotes. That seems outrageous. The system, 
the system itself is twenty three thousand dollars. That seems outrageous for a minute. Yes. So it's it's <laughs> two separate systems cons consisting of one indoor head and one outdoor condenser. Yeah. They're heat pump systems, so they supply heating and cooling. Right. The square footage of the senior center is about eighteen hundred square feet. I'm just going with the information I have. So um, we it's, have we're nothing that we're agreeing to at this point. Right. I'm just saying those. I mean, I put one in my. 1400 unit square foot unit that is the same age as the senior center and the, and we replaced a, a three ton unit with it with a mini split we did it for forty two hundred dollars i want to say and aren't we changing this from three phase to yeah. you know leaving it three phase now because if the electrical is not on there the price is going to go down so if the heat's not on the electrical anymore it's going to go down significantly anyway one of the thoughts in this too is we talk about having a warming center and a cooling center and the, the senior center makes sense to have that. We're not, not going to have a shelter because we can't. A shelter is overnight. You have to have an animal control officer on hand. You have police on hand. You have to have medical people on hand. You have to have food, sleeping quarters, and so on. But we can always always have a warming or a cooling center so someone can come in and warm up or cool down and plug in and get their phones charged and their computers charged, and they'd be there for a shorter period of time. So by having an upgraded heating and cooling system, it makes sense that if we're going to get this grant for 15000 plus and Eversource wants to give us another four to 6000 and we can get some more competitive bids other than the one you have, why, we'd be crazy not to do it at this time. And then the difference, make up the difference with what, what's left of our own ARPA fund. That would be the, the, the hope. Um, so before we identify all the uses for the funds. I wanted to make sure you guys knew about this source and the fact that we're going to need some additional funds. Um, so if you're in favor, I can start getting additional quotes and not not committing to it, just committing to you're okay with that idea. You don't think that there's a desperate need for something else at the senior center. I would trust Teresa to let us know what was most helpful. I'm fine with continuing to get additional quotes and then come back and have it be discussed at a future meeting. And we'll definitely discuss it and vote and make yeah. sure everyone knows what's going on. Okay. That's cool. More free money. The next thing is um, in your packet, if you look at the approved ARPA funds, um, the Second to last line says where we are at. So we currently have $61,270.70 that hasn't been allocated. Um, the uh, EDC had discussion of closing out their small business program. They didn't have quorum at their meeting, so I'm not sure. Well, they voted. They didn't, they didn't have a quorum. quorum. They only had four people. They have eight people on their board. I swear I thought they. They definitely voted. They voted. They didn't they, have quorum. They, they didn't realize they didn't have quorum. They voted in okay. incorrectly. So. Okay. Um, it's up to you if you want to wait until they have a vote, since you know they did discuss it. Um, if you wanted to deobligate that money and close out that program, um, that's $33,181.09. So that would bring the total remaining up to $94,451.79. If you'd rather wait until they have their meeting and have quorum, we can wait. It doesn't matter. It doesn't impact anything. I just wanted to give you that option today. I have multiple okay. emails from them intending to do it. If you yeah. want, go. Right. I, I think that I would it's clear. Though. Say that again. I said their intention was clear. Yeah. But if they didn't have everybody there that they needed, but the people that were all there all agreed. It was yeah. Not just any dissenters, right? So. I mean, if it's not, if we don't, if we can wait to make it official until they have one that changes. Yeah, I. Uh, I don't wait. Know. I, I would hate to just approve. Um, Trying to think who so technically the board they could move things forward economic development commission with their if there's three executive members present who was at the meeting i Sam, know the secretary was will out. mason yeah i don't know who their other i think it was peggy and mariah you're right i mariah. heard mariah's voice yeah i i 
I've honestly been pregnant before. Just let me talk to her. Sweet. I would rather just wait until there is an official vote. Um, okay. So we'll revisit in July. But that's but, just but we have the number, so we know what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, we know where we're going to fall. But um, and then the last thing, um, so we committed to three years of the Everbridge Municipal Notification System, but we only approved fifteen thousand dollars in expenses. So we need to approve an additional four thousand one hundred twenty-five dollars for this for the August invoice. Um, we have to go to the Board of Finance for these. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. So this is another appropriation of, yep. of, of ARPA funds. Oh, of ARPA. Of ARPA. Okay. Yes. So it's just committing an additional $4,125 to the municipal notification system, which we do through Everbridge. So did we signed a three-year con contract? We did. With a have we used it? Administration. Well, we use it? We use it. We will, we just not it. as many people as we hope will be on it. So, so I swear I, I signed up for it. I don't think that I've ever gotten that alert. Alert. We sent them out for the election. And so oh, I, most definitely, well, I just know we sent them out most recently for the election. Huh. Yeah, well, I can have Jim, Jim check to see if we signed up. Mm -hmm. um, so when we, I had Jim run the numbers when I was looking at this last, so May 16th, um, we had 212 users signed oh, up. So we're going to try to do a lot more of a push to get people yeah. registered for the, the program. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I think it might be beneficial to talk to the, the, the school at some point because their, their system, they can use it for multiple different things, but there's no extra charges for the amount of messages that go out. So there might be a benefit of both of us using the same system. I mean, if they're paying six thousand and we're paying six thousand, maybe I don't know what they're paying. I'm just yeah, saying. But wasn't there just some big controversy on social media? Or that was, no, that was about getting the vote out. About yeah, exactly. Like we, all they did was just put out a reminder to vote, not for or against. And I thought that there was a big controversy. Right, but it would be used. You you could use it as a separate entity so i mean i don't know i'm just saying we might want to before we so yeah I mean, we have to do this we have to do this Jim's before we resign or make sure there's no rollover that we look at that because if we can save some money by using the same system jim had the same idea okay. um his idea was bringing them over to us not us going to them but um so he's supposed to talk i think to troy because he said that greg doesn't handle it on the school side because right. well, everbridge is like the gold standard of this kind of service so yeah if they so, can come to us, that'd be great too so we'll see what we can do um for shared services on that because that minimal amount of use makes it yeah when you think of the dollar value that's it on our, it on our phones right yes okay uh planning conservation wait whoa, whoa, whoa. So someone needs to, to make a motion oh we do so I'll make a, I'll make a motion to send to the Board of Finance a request for an additional ARPA fund appropriation of four thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars for the Everbridge system. Did I get that right? Yes. I'll make a sec. I'll make a sec. I'll second. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Um, you done with Appa? Yeah. yeah. Planning conservation development. Um, that was scheduled. We we're going to have the visioning session on the 24th of June. 24th of June came really fast. Um, and we didn't feel like we were going to get a good turnout because we didn't ha have enough time to get the information we wanted to get out, out. We put a push on trying to get surveys done. We got quite a few more, but nowhere near the number we were hoping for. And because the project, we we're going to team up the visioning session of the POCD with the closeout of the demolition project. We do them on the same date. And since that's not closed out, and now we get school getting out, graduation, people worried about you know what they're going to do, you know, and, and vacations and so on. We thought it'd be better just to wait and push it back to early fall once school gets back in, so we can talk about the. The demo project in the POCD at that point, and that gives us three months to get additional surveys done. Um, it's not going to, talking to Julia, it's not going to back us up at all because she still has time to get done what she has to. This is like the be the last big piece, and she's working on all the other things at the same time. So 
Um, I think it's smart. I think that summertime um, is a difficult time. She didn't want to get like 20 people here yeah. and then it's disappointing. So if we can do it, people come back from the, the summer, they're invigorated, kids back in school. It's a little crisper out, you know, the weather's nice and cool. And <laughs> so I thought it would be a good idea. So we'll set a date for maybe early September, if that makes sense. Okay. Good. I was, I, when we first were changing, I'm like, I hope they don't push for July or August because that'll no, be brutal. No, it just, in the middle of summer, it's tough to get people to, yeah, I wouldn't is. want to spend a Saturday here in three hours on this. But once the kids are back on school and you're, there's more commitment to be in town. Yeah, and especially after school gets out. So we used to hold a, a thing, a block party at Holly Green years ago. And it did so great until one year we pushed it until after school got out. And everyone goes away on vacation yeah. those first few first weeks of the weeks. summer, it seems. All righty. Um, any discussion on that? We still have people online. Who? Is it Bitsy? No, Bitsy's sleeping right now. So. <laughs> All right, can I do minutes? Sure, please. Uh, so I'll make a motion to approve the Town of North Stonington Board of Selectmen meeting um, minutes uh, on uh, May 23rd, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. held at the North Stonington Education Center and via Zoom as written. Okay. Second. Brett seconds. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Entertain a motion for oh our next meeting next Wait, meeting. we just a oh, public comment. I just I was, still, I was on a second page. Sorry, opens their mouth on the no. screen. I wanted to see if there was any way we can potentially move that next meeting to move who? next what so next like meeting? any other day but that Tuesday. Oh, Monday. Monday. We have a tri tri board meeting on Monday, the twenty sixth. Why are you not going to be in town? No, I have another uh, meeting that I have to go to. Right? And then I blow off every other one. How about... Um, it is also the Wheeler Library Summer Concert Series with Dan Oh, Watson. the first one. Yeah. That's the first one. Yeah. Do you guys do next Tuesday? Um, I'm uh, at Rod's. Oh, um, yeah. You have to do. What times are all boards and commissions? Five boards at... Six thirty. Oh, it's six. six. But uh, Christine has to move back to six thirty because she's going to a board, board of education board. finance committee meeting Friday at five. So it's at six thirty. Yeah. Uh, are you, you going to be there for that? Sorry, board. Nicole. Oh yeah, the twenty sixth, right? Yes. Yes. So what time's your meeting, Brett? It's at uh, like uh, six o'clock. In the middle of the state. Oh, figured. Uh, um, well, could you join virtually on your way back? No, I wouldn't make it. No, it's it's. I mean, you can meet without me. I'm just thinking. That there was I don't think there's going to be anything really big on that. No, agenda. I think we covered everything tonight. We have to finalize the, oh, the bulky and procedures. Oh, yeah, so talk about the bulky waste. Um, there's a whole bunch of things on the whiteboard in my office. I wish I could remember what they are. <sighs> So we do it after the all boards and commissioners. That won't be that long. That starts at six thirty. Should be over by seven thirty. I, I think. think it's going to go until eight. What, you think so? I do. Um, board of Finance wants to talk about capital planning and the budget process. What about uh, Thursday the twenty ninth? Um, I could do it at seven ish. I could just be back in time for that. I could do Thursday. Uh, the 29th at 7. I can do that. I can do that. If we do it at 7, I could be here. I'm coming out. right from the golf course. Hmm. You need shorts and a golf shirt. But I could be here because I would just make... I can do that. Yeah, and know too, if, if I'm running late, you can start the meeting without me. I can get here. I'll get here. So, so but yeah, why don't we just, why don't we do that? Thursday the 29th and... Okay. Because I can do it any other time, the 27th, just not at night. Yeah, but since we're talking about bulky waste fees, and we should do it where we're going to get attendance. Right. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I can do that. So, you know, and if worst comes to worst, I'll just come to the meeting. I can get someone else from Pleasant Hill right now. Can't be so, June 27th. 29th. Twenty-seven. 
you could have told me anything right now, I would have believed you. I would have wrote down whatever you said. Monday at five, I would have wrote that down. All right. Okay, public comments. Is there any public comment, Brian? Okay, well, you know what? God um, bless you, Brian. <laughs> thank you for sticking it out. I appreciate God, it. He, we need to give you a citation. The band, I'm trying. We're trying. Uh, anything online? Any public comment online? Okay. Okay, so the next meeting is not June 27th. It's June 29th at 7 o'clock. And I'll t entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn at 1037. I think it's a record. I second that. Okay.